skeleton crew. <laughs> What's up guys, this is Alex from the Skeleton Crew, and I got a special for you, something that I wanted to do for a long time. The Transfers movies are some of my favorite stuff, cheesy 80s, really great, classic movies. It's the kind of trilogy that needs to be seen, all three of them, for it all to come together, and for it all to be, like, part two makes part one better, and part three doesn't make part one or two better but it it's a nice round out at least for Helen Hunt's character because she's in all three of the, of the first three movies then there's three more transfers but they're pretty crappy so uh, this is a special where um, myself and Jerry Herring and Kenneth from Kill the Cast got together we did this a couple years ago I think it was April 1st 2019 and Jerry was kind enough to let me broadcast this on the Skeleton Crew channel. As you know, the Skeleton Crew is... Uh, the doors have closed, let's just say. We are no longer the crew. Jamie is focusing on the Horror in the House of Salmon's podcast. Look for her there. Dan Chase is doing his Cut to the Chase stuff. Look for him there. Dave Z is doing Exploding Heads. That's all he has time for. And I retired from the Married with Children podcast uh, probably around the same time we've closed the doors for the Skeleton Crew. Um, if anybody is into the Skeleton Crew enough to care about little details like dates of events or whatever, you could pretty much say the Skeleton Crew um, was done for good. June 5th, 2020 was the day it all ended. Um, then... We had some shows in the can, and Dave Z joined us to record one last thing since those days, and that was the house review, which was our final show, which I believe was released on Halloween, or the day before Halloween. I may do a couple things on my own. I had a couple of uh, ideas. I definitely don't want to um, start up a new team or anything like that, so I was thinking if I got, you know the bug to do something it would be in the form of really short solo cast shows or something like that like for example if um the new halloween movie or something like that like i might just sit down and and give thoughts for 25 or so minutes uh something like that so anyway it is what it is that might happen it might not but right now is a special presentation this was from kill the cast April 1st, 2019, we do the three Trancer movies with Tim Thomerson and Helen Hunt. Definitely look those up. Don't just stop at part one. No matter what you think of part one, watch part two. And then it'll all really kind of become something different for you. And then you'll want to see part three, and then that is what it is, and end it right there. But uh, here's our review. Hope you enjoy. Hello everyone, welcome to Kill the Cast. My name is Jerry, and on this very special episode, we have the man who has singed his last trancer, the Silent Hill biker himself, Kenneth, how you doing? Uh, good morning all, good morning all. From the Skeleton Crew and the Married with Children podcast, is the man who thinks dry hair is for squids, Alex Edwards. Fuck him. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and if you haven't guessed by now, this very special episode, two years in the making, <laughs> is for the Trancers trilogy. Uh, these are sci-fi action movies done by the uh, legendary, question mark, Full Moon Studios. Charles Band, man. Yeah, this is all Alex Edwards. In fact, if you think this 
episode is super well produced, it's because Alex Edwards is producing it. <laughs> so it's it's going to be a, a special treat for you, Fed. So if you like his production, you should listen to the Skeleton Crew and Mary Children podcast because they all have high fucking production. Yeah. It's beautiful. Thanks. Speaking of which, Alex, tell the people out there who they should know as they listen to Kill the Cast. Who you are, what you do, and and why we are here this morning. Who I am. Uh, Back in 2012, me and some friends started up a horror podcast called The Skeleton Crew. It uh, gained a lot of momentum, picked up, and we landed in the right network. And we got like a little family of other shows that we became all buddies and stuff. And from there, you know, you start working with other people. It's time to wind that down around 2017, and then I started the Married with Children podcast at that same time, about a year before I retired that show. So that And that show, Jerry was on from Kill the Cast, and he was on for like a year and three months, and then now it's the whole Skeleton Crew people on that show. So if you like the Skeleton Crew, it's the same vibe, same type of thing, and it's about Al Bundy and all that good stuff. Uh, and I do guest spots on Kill the Cast. You may have heard me in the Friday 13th Part 2 show. Um, and the reason we're doing this show, um, Trancers is, uh, something I discovered one time. Just a weird thing. I saw a post on a friend's Facebook, and it was all six of the VHS tapes just laying down on a rug or something. And I just, like, looked. I was like, what is that? And, um, I don't know. Something about the name or the, the covers or something. It, and the, the amount that there are, uh, I was just fascinated by it. I was like, why have I never heard of something that has six movies? And it's the 80s, and I love that. And uh, sci-fi action's cool. And um, so something just compelled me to either download them or something. Or maybe I went on Amazon and I bought this, like, six-pack. I remember they had that on DVD. Or three-pack. So I watched these, and I don't know. There's just something, like... Something weird about them that is uh, intriguing, and there's a, a style. And Tim Thomerson is is actually a great leading man, and Helen Hunt is Helen Hunt, the fifty five million dollar chick, you know. And uh, I don't know, it was just such an interesting story. And time travel is always cool, and eighties is always cool. And uh, so I watched all five of them, and the last two sucked, but it makes for a good trilogy. I like the first three movies, so I started telling people about it and uh sending them links and stuff and jerry took an interest kenneth took an interest and they were like okay yeah that's cool you know i'm into that kind of stuff too uh let's do it what the hell let's do some weird shit so we tried we planned on doing it i think around in, in 2017 or something and i don't know there was just always like either we just never talked about it or there was a reason we couldn't then we didn't talk about it then there was a reason and now here we are. It's almost two years later, and I still have my notes from 2017 for some of this. <laughs> so that's it. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, we there, and there was also a big bout in 2018 where I uh, had too many health problems, and one of the reasons I left married with children were health reasons, and we I kind of stopped doing a bunch of podcast guest appearances and stuff like that. I could barely keep kill the cast uh, going with my health. But now, since I'm on the right track to better health and a better life, nice. it's time to do the transers. Now, when Alex first told me about transers, never fucking heard of it. Uh, he told me about it. I looked at it, and I was like, oh, so it's trying to be like the cheap B version of um, Blade Runner. Right. And while it does have some similarities with Blade Runner, and it's definitely you know, a smaller budget than Blade Runner – it holds its own and does it does not actually I, I i don't want to call it a rip off of blade runner even though it does you know take some elements from it it definitely holds up on its own and this the first movie which we're about to get into i honestly think might be one of the best full moon movies ever made wow nice uh i mean the, i don't know it doesn't have that much competition i know <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, dude. The subspecies movies are pretty fucking badass. Yeah, okay. I really like those. So, um, I've been watching Full Moon stuff since I was a teenager. So. Hmm. Yeah. Now, Kenneth, had you heard of Trancers before Alex started shoving it down everyone's throat? <laughs> Actually, believe it or not, as long as I've been 
watching Full Moon stuff, I had never paid attention to the Trancer series. I had watched um, Castle Freak and Doll Man and um, obviously Subspecies and then uh, what were some of the others that came Puppet out? Puppet Master? Yeah, Puppet Master, absolutely. Um, you know, and I think Puppet Master is probably the most well-known Full Moon movie out there. Um, but, and I and I pay attention to others that were out there like the, the Eyeball One and fucking... Uh, uh, what is it called? Ginger Dead Man or something like that. And yeah. then I had seen Killjoy and 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 uh, I'd watched one of the Evil Bong movies and it was so fucking ridiculous that I didn't watch none of the rest of them. Um, but uh, but I had never paid attention to Trancers and I'm kind of after watching these three, I'm kind of irritated that I never paid attention to them because yeah. I, especially the first two, the third one was still pretty good, but the first two, especially the first two, I really enjoyed them. I mean, obviously, you know, it's full moon special effects. You know what I'm saying? But I, I, I you know, full moon is about as B as it gets next to trauma. And, mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> and, but for, for them being the B movies that they are, they actually were really good. Yeah. Uh, we'll go ahead and get into, uh, Trancers now that everyone has given their uh, how they found Trancers. Last January, I finally singed Martin Whistler out in one of the Rim planets. Since then, I've been hunting down the last of his murdering cult. We call them Trancers, slaves to Whistler's psychic power. Not really alive, and not dead enough. It's July now, and I'm tired. Real tired. Coming out in 1984. With a budget of four hundred thousand dollars, pretty good. Not not too bad. Uh, it involves a, a a guy named Jack Death, which is, by the way, great name. Uh, right. And, and I'll be honest. When you hear, oh, it's a movie called Transfers, and the guy's called Jack Death, you immediately kind of roll your eyes. But then when you watch the movie, it fits. Transfers. I feel like is a movie that you really have to watch because if you go off just what you're told, it it doesn't work. Like, listen to this. Jack Death is a kind of cop bounty hunter in the bleak Los Angeles future. He becomes obsessed with chasing Whistler, an evil criminal who uses powerful hypnotic powers to transform people into zombie-like creatures known as Trancelers. Whistler has managed to escape through time travel and is loose in the 1980s L.A., but death is on his trail. Sounds fucking like a bummer to me. I, I would not watch that movie. Extreme 80s cheese. Yeah, based off that. But then when you actually watch the movie, I, I was honestly kind of surprised that it was a full moon movie. I mean, hell, it's got a 6.1 on INDB for, which is... 6.1 is pretty decent for a movie like this. Um, I kind of put it in the same area where, where I do with, like, a lot of horror movies. You kind of have to add two points on IMDb. Right. Uh, okay, so. I watched this for the first time back in 2017 when we were originally going to do it. And I was blown away. I, I, I bought the first three movies on Blu-ray. And what the? I bought the first uh, three movies on Blu-ray, and I was just like, man, this first one's so good, but I didn't actually watch the second or third because all the shit was going on, so I've finally done that. But with this one, the coolest thing about this movie is the time travel. How they do the time travel in this movie is they inject you with this serum that allows your consciousness to travel down the line to the past to go into a body that is a relative of yours it has to be someone in your family which is one of the the just coolest ways to do time travel because a lot of people know especially they listen to jerry hates action they know i hate fucking time travel movies i get so caught up with trying to to figure out the paradoxes and all this shit and to me this is one of the best ideas ever because you won't run into uh you know being the same person the two people at the same place at the same time you don't have to worry about that and to me that's amazing because a lot of times when you have someone going back to assassinate it is like the bad guy like you see like in terminator 
But with this one, it's them sending the good guy back to keep that from happening and keep the future the way it's supposed to be. They're actually not going back to change the future to save it and make it not be a devastated wreck because technically they couldn't because in this movie, the future is ruined because of a giant earthquake. Right. Uh, Los Angeles is in the ocean. It's uh, 2247. Oh, so close. <clears throat> yeah. Um, well, a lot of people also cite this as a knockoff of a Terminator movie. And there's actually one very reminiscent scene in Transfers 3, which is very much like a flashback John Connor had in Terminator Part 1. When they're, like, walking through the hallways and all the soldiers just keep popping out, then you give the signal and they let you keep walking. Like, that's remember the John Connor scene when that happened? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so like, uh, you know, it's reminiscent of that. Uh, like you said, Blade Runner. Even though there were James Bond in it um, with all the gadgets and... And then having the old school um, detective, that was one of my favorite parts that had the old school detective vibe like you would see in, in gangster movies of the it, that 30s was one, and 40s. That was probably my favorite thing about the first one was that, you know, I really like that, that, that noir feel that it had. I really, really enjoyed that. You know what I'm saying? Even down to the music, the jazzy kind of music and then having death's uh, narration over the top of it. I really, really liked it. Well, the music is phenomenal. That, you know, music really just puts something over. And this is a perfect example. It's anything but generic. It fits the tone and the lighting and the acting and the noir so well. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and on that, uh, the one the one thing that I think the first transfer movie knocks out perfectly is you don't have to worry about, like, um, if we do something, it changes the future, so it creates a new future. So now we're looking at, like, uh, the future is in branching paths. So when you go back, you're not – you might go back to a different future, um, which you see happen a lot of time travel movies where uh, – it creates a whole different future. I like, I always think about uh, how well they explain it in Dragon Ball Z when uh, I'm skin super nerdy. When Trunks goes back to a future, he technically goes back to a different future. Uh, and the, his old future technically is still there and everyone's dying horrible deaths due to the androids. And in this movie, you really don't have that problem because his consciousness goes right back to his body in the exact same future. And technically nothing they did in the past affects that future because they were stopping someone who wanted to affect that future. Right. Right. But when he does actually change the future, it's weird because Whistler kills two of the council members and so one of them was the the tanning guy. So it was the man who who was killed on the council besides the old woman. And it's weird because in this movie, just he disappears, but everything is exactly the same. Now, if he were to never been born, wouldn't they have hired two other people to be on the council? Like, why are we in that same reality of the future when they're just not there? Well, he just kicked a big plot hole into to my thoughts of the movie. Way to go, Alex. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, and see, there there, there itself in lies every single time travel movie's paradox. Mm-hmm. Where you can think about different things that have happened that would change. You know, if we were to get into a big thing about Back to the Future, there's a shitload of stuff in there that would have, that, that, that's fucked up. You know, so that's the reason why a lot of times when uh, Jerry and I watch movies about time travel... I'm like, okay, don't pay attention to the bullshit that no. comes. Don't don't you overthink can't. it, because you if you overthink <laughs> it, you know you're gonna find holes. You're always gonna find holes, and I, I honestly think I, I I think in itself, you know, as much as a lot of us out there would like to think that at some point in time we could go do some form of time travel, you know, like I would I would absolutely love to be able to go back and be like, you know, hey dad, start going to the doctor. You're gonna get cancer. You know what I'm saying? I would love to be able to do that. But unfortunately, there's going to be something something fucked up is going to happen that you're going to change because shit is meant to happen the way it's going to happen. That's the way I feel about it. He's not going to do what he was going to do that day because he'll be like, my son just came from the freaking future <laughs> and he's going to like right. tell everybody and, and like act different and do different things. And, and that now instead of going 
to this place, he's going to go to the doctor. Now he didn't do that, so that's going to set up a whole chain of events. And then right. he didn't do the next five years or ten years of things he was supposed to do, and God only knows what that would do, you know? Yeah, and see, so the next thing that would happen is then, okay, what happens to the future me that knows that he got cancer to come back? Well, I've just changed all that shit. Right. So it's just like, it, it, like I said, it's a paradox. It always will be. It's purely for entertainment. Yeah. That's all, you know? That That's how you got to... You got to think of these things. You can't think any other way because yeah. it's just crazy. Now, what do you guys think of um, the idea of going down the line and ending up in someone's body? Because the the standout scene that you always got to wonder is when when Jack finally gets to have, and I mean Jack, finally gets to have sex with Lena in that dude's apartment. They wake him up in in twenty twenty four what twenty two forty seven, and he his consciousness is there. So that means that Phil, Phil's consciousness, the body that Jack took over in nineteen eighty five, he or four, he woke up, and now he's in bed with Lena. Now, that's not crazy, you know. He 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 just slept with her a day or two ago anyway, so that's not crazy. But isn't he like what what is this? What is this place we're in? How do we get here? And, I don't know, man. If I just woke up from a daze and I had a hot chick and you know, right there, about ready to go down on me or whatever, I don't, I don't think I would say anything. Yeah, you think that, but <laughs> it's the '80s. He's, he probably thinks he's coming out of a drug binge and doesn't realize. I mean, it could be anything, bro. Yeah, but he seemed like a good guy. He was like uh, making love to you is like the joining of a two uh, souls or something. Whatever he said to her in the beginning. So I don't know if he's like a drug guy. So like. Yes, of course, as, as a guy, we think, well, yeah, sure, we'll just roll with it. But but it's weird to think that Phil woke up and then did that and then just disappeared. And then... Hey, maybe he could have thought that he was in the same night. I mean, think about that. I mean, hey, I, when, when he goes down, he could have been thinking that he was just asleep and that he woke up. There she was, and he's supposed to go, he's supposed to go at it again. Well, then I was thinking, like, in part three... Uh, yeah, when they... when. Uh, are we uh, are we jumping around everything, or do you, do you want to do like reviews for each one? Uh, I'd rather do reviews for each one, just because. Okay. Get a little crazy mixing all three together. Yeah. My issue with that scene is actually because, uh, like, you see later on when Wexler leaves the body of his relative, the relative seems to be in pain. Uh, so it almost seems like um, you do have some kind of like painful wake up from your conscious being set aside so like do you, that's why I like think the what makes the most sense is that he comes out of a drug binge because he's hurting from fucking the partying and drug binge but he's inside a chick so you know he automatically kicks into that Kenneth brain and he's like <laughs> oh well fuck the pain I'm gonna keep going hell yeah All right, can we talk about transfers then oh yeah so <laughs> in this movie there are these zombie like uh creatures uh they're not they mostly look like the lead singer of the cure <laughs> uh is the best way to describe them they just get like dark around the eyes and you get to see some veins and, and a paler skin um and in this movie they are explained as wexler has a psychic control over weak-minded individuals kind of like bella lugosi and white zombie and how he makes zombies it's kind of like that except uh, in the future and he has control over these uh, people where they're in their zombie like state and it's called trancing hmm. well the question I have is what is this state of mind and do they go in and out of it all the time or does he already have them pinpointed and it turns on right when he wants it to and then how does he know that it want, he wants it to at this time, and is he observing anything that makes him decide to make them trance out? Like this woman in in the um, the cafe uh, thing in the, in the beginning, she just turns on Jack Death because she's a trancer, and then Santa Claus, he seems to know because he's like, "Welcome to the 20th century, Jack Death." Yeah, so it does make it seem like. Um... Whistler has a psychic connection with them, so he can kind of see through their eyes, so to speak. But my only issue with that is the the black lady from the beginning of the movie, because by that time Whistler's already in the past. So how do you get psychic? All control? connected like Professor X. 
uh, through time and space than fucking it i don't know like the, like there are some issues with this movie once you start really breaking it down and thinking about it but it's one of those movies that it's so entertaining you kind of don't even think about it while you're watching it you kind of think about it later yeah maybe we shouldn't think about it like on that level maybe we should keep it on the surface because it's almost like we're trying to poke holes through this and I'm definitely not and I know you guys aren't and you were you know praising it for certain things so we're not really trying to do that yeah I think that we're gonna run into that though if, if we do go anywhere under the surface yeah I want to talk about a couple of really just good scenes uh, there's a scene where they're in a uh, Jack and, and Lena Lena is actually played by Helen Hunt, so there's a big fucking name for this movie. You know, my favorite thing about that is, is that she came back to do the others. Oh, yes. yeah, dude. Yeah, especially the third one, because, you know, once the third one came out, she was well on into her career. Mm-hmm. And she still came back to 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 play this, even though it was a small area, she came back to play Yeah, she only part. had, like, two actual scenes. Right. That's loyalty, man. Yeah, I got to give her credit for that. Yeah, m- most people wouldn't have done that. Jack and Lena are in a uh, club where a punk band's playing. And one of Lena's old boyfriend comes over and kind of gives them shit and spits in Jack's face. And Jack <laughs> just knocks him the fuck out. And then the look he gives to Lena and then goes back to dancing like, oh, yeah, I kind of like this shit. Uh... That is so great. It's one of my favorite scenes in this movie. And there's so many good scenes in this movie. Shake a wheel, shake a wheel, shake a hell of a Like, oh my god, is that the worst band I've ever heard in my life? I'm sorry, my favorite scene in this movie is Dry Hairs for Squids. That was my favorite scene. That was, I, I thought, I cracked me fuck up when he said that shit. Dry hairs and then puts squids. that stuff in his hair. She goes, what's that shit you're putting in your hair? Yeah, and he's like, Dry Hairs for Squids. I was <laughs> like, hell no, man, that was awesome. Oh, one of the best examples of writing dialogue in this movie is the three wise men scene. Uh, yeah. Jack and Lena, while hunting for um, one of the ancestors, Ashby, who used to be a professional baseball pitcher and is now just a drunk homeless person, they go to find <laughs> uh, find him. So they find some drunk guys that are all sitting around a barrel. It's your classic, you know, bum fire. And... Uh, Jack tells Lena, look, play along. I, this is this is what a cop does. And they basically play into the, the, the three bums or the three wise men. And it's just such a cleverly written scene and so well acted by all five actors in the scene. It, it's really just – it kind of elevates you and makes you realize how good this movie is. Everyone is a pretty good actor – Except for like the like the tertiary characters, which is say like most things are be- even like Hap Ashby. I mean, I I think they actually just took a guy out of the gutter and just put a cam to- told him to keep rolling. So the guy who played <laughs> Hap Ashby was actually drunk the entire movie, uh, and he was actually really good friends with the guy who played Jack. And uh, so like Jack had to literally hold the guy up a lot of times because <laughs> he was so bombed through this movie. That's fantastic. <laughs> And like what the, the the amazing thing about Hap Ashby, like the whole point of this is that Jack's supposed to go back in time and save this guy so that he could procreate. Like, who was he gonna have sex with if Jack didn't intervene? Like, <laughs> like, w- like, when was this all supposed to turn around if Jack never showed up? Because in reality, all Jack's doing is keeping him alive. He was supposed to have done this regardless. Where when would that have taken place? Hey, man, you probably got drunk with another one of the bum chicks that are out there and knocked her up. I mean, it's L.A., dude. I mean, you know, all kinds of shit goes on out there. The air is dirty and the sex is clean. <laughs> the, uh, and I love how I everyone makes... that the other day. Oh, yeah? <laughs> oh, what movie is that? Point Break. Oh, no, oh, Jesus, not that movie again. Yeah, buddy. <laughs> uh, I love how everyone makes fun of Jack's name because when you have a name like Jack Death... Like I said earlier, when someone tells you about this movie, it sounds so fucking corny and ridiculous. You don't want to watch it. But it's so well done. And in the point of awareness where they make fun of Jack Death's name throughout the movie is just so clever. and makes you realize, hey, we know that the idea of this 
is corny, but our execution is fantastic. Right. I actually really like his name. Um, I think it's great that it's spelled, you know, like the end of Megadeth. <laughs> I think that's awesome. Um, so, you know, I mean, obviously this movie has got a level of cheese in it, but I think it's a, I think it's a very, very, it's one of those movies that is part of the reason why it's great is because it's cheesy. And it's not cheesy in, in like um, a bad way. Not it's, like rubber. It's not <laughs> so bad it's good. It's right. good, clean, 80s cheese done exactly right. Because the cheese is never in your face or overdone. It's authentic cheese. Ridiculous. It's, yes, it is authentic American cheese. <laughs> it's not government cheese. It's American. This is Sargento level of cheese. There you go. It's not gum and cheese. Uh, <laughs> how about how about this guy Death running around in a Loomis trench coat? <laughs> I think it's awesome. <laughs> it's so every great. time every time that he just grabs the things and ties them around his waist, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I thought it was great. Every time I've seen that, and I, I don't know, I really like the character. I, I really like the Jack Death character. I think he's fucking funny. I think that. His level of awareness with everything that's going on is great. I like the fact that they tied in the whole, you know, he's got that disgruntled attitude because his wife died. Hmm. I, I really like everything that they put into it. I mean, it's just, it, it's, it's fucking, <laughs> to take it one step further, I mean, it's just 80s Americana. It's a good fucking movie. Yeah, and I really love, uh, like I said earlier, they've got like some James Bond stuff in here. <laughs> they've got this watch called yeah. The Long Second where you can press it and it turns one second into 10 seconds or if you're going on Hollywood time, 90 seconds. Yeah. Uh, but it's really cool because there is a scene where right after he meets up with the uh, tan surfer guy who's the ancestor of one on the council and that whole shit goes down badly, he is caught, him and Lena are caught outside by Wessler and his police and he uses the long second to get him and Lena out of there. And it goes to this very touching scene that kind of shows the growing romance that's going to come out of these two characters. Where Lena's like, why didn't you waste Wexler? And he's like, well, I couldn't save you and kill him. So I saved you. And then she admits that, look, when you went into the, the tan place, I stole your car and left. I only came back because I thought about it and I think the story makes sense. Which is... It's weird that someone would think that his story makes fucking sense, but it is Los Angeles, and she did see uh, Santa Claus turn into a fucking black metal Santa Claus in an instant. Right. Hell yeah. Yeah, that Santa scene. How about the kid? <laughs> when, when uh, you know, they have to film these kids' reactions. Oh, my God. Dude, fuck Die Hard. This is my new Christmas movie. I wonder how much of that shit... The, the kids didn't know was being filmed. Yeah, right. Or, or like, like, or they didn't know that that was going to happen, and they just got their honest reaction. I, I was, I was assuming that the kids never really saw Santa get shot or anything. Like, uh, I assumed that. Yeah, who knows? You know. Um, <clears throat> what about the whole Christmas thing? Like, all we get out of the Christmas thing is the the guys singing the song in the punk club. You got him saying, "Nice tan, very Christmassy." Which is from a uh, a line that's actually taken from a gangster noir movie. Can't remember what movie it is off the top of my head, but the line is directly taken from that movie. Does this make Trancers a Christmas movie? Yes, that's what I said. Fuck Die Hard. We got Trancers. And part three. It's got at least three Christmas scenes, even if one is uh, one dialogue only. But to me... That makes it a Christmas movie, so it's joining the ranks of Jaws of Revenge and Krampus as the best Christmas movies. Nice. Yeah, the other one was when she gave him the robot toy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was the third one. Or no, that was technically fourth then, because I was thinking of the uh, punk uh, musical. Oh, right, right. Mm -hmm. This whole thing where, not that I'm trying to get away from this movie, but it, it almost feels like this had to be at least... Two at least, but three movies to really flesh everything completely out. Because like Kenneth said, when he talked about the disgruntled guy, you know, because his wife died and this and that. 
Look at how they play upon that in the second one. Like, bringing yeah. all these levels into this. And I'll say this. The character of Jack Death is so good that you want sequels. But the character of Jack Death is so good that I'm kind of sitting here like, you know what, Hollywood, you want to remake something? Let me get a big budget remake of this. I want to see Jack Death scuba diving underwater looking at a sunken uh, Chinese theater. Oh, you're talking about like Waterworld? Yeah, like <laughs> I would like to see a big budget version of Transfers. I think it would do really well. I, I think you could do so much more with it. Having a giant budget, it would lose all of its like cheese, but I think it could be a damn good action movie, especially with the sci-fi elements. Well, if I ever win the lottery, I'll give fucking Full Moon like twenty million dollars to read. Okay, let's give it to someone better. Yeah, we don't have to give it to them. <laughs> Full Moon owns it. Yeah, but we could just buy. You could probably buy. You know. Yeah, I don't but imagine. It, all right, imagine if you gave them twenty million dollars to make it to make it, or, or, or hell, or let's say fifty million dollars to to remake this movie. I think that it would be awesome for Full Moon to make a movie with that big a budget. I just don't know if they could handle it. Charles is always busy uh, finding inventory in his. Uh, a warehouse that supposedly is out of print. I don't know if he could handle such a big budget. By the way, uh, by the way, I, I I did this to watch these movies. I joined the Full Moon tre- streaming thing. Oh wow! Yeah, and uh, if you join the, if you pay for the three month subscription, which is like eighteen bucks, they send you free Blu rays. Do they let you pick them or? I uh, I don't know. I don't know because I, I only did the one month, but I'm thinking about doing the just going ahead and doing the three months. Because as I was scrolling through all their stuff, I'm like, oh wow, these are some gems from when I was a kid that I'd like to watch again. <laughs> yeah, because on the Blu-rays, it actually does have that advertisement where Charles Band tells you about the service, and he does mention you'll get three DVDs or Blu-rays, but it doesn't go into whether you get to pick them or what. Yeah, because I watched part three on Blu-ray, so. Uh, but yeah, I want to, uh, thanks to Alex, I think. Um, and, uh, so I, I'm actually thinking about doing it. Cause like I said, I mean, there's some gems that I want to go back and watch anyway. But the cool thing about it is, is on the streaming site, all the fucking full moon production, special features and shit like that is all on there. Like the video really? zones and all the rest of that. It's all on there. That's one thing that's missing from streaming sites are special features and commentaries. Right. Like, and you can, and you can do all that on here. That's on purpose, though. They do that so you... Because, remember, these guys are getting paid to put their movie on Netflix. So, they'll do that, but they're going to double dip because they want you to still buy the Blu-ray to get that stuff. See, they don't have the investment Charles Band has. This is all he has. So, he's giving you everything just so you please, please, somebody, just please do the service, you know? Netflix isn't really as desperate. That's the true. only thing that I wish about their site is that you had the ability to cast. Like, I had to watch Transfers 2 uh, sitting here where I'm sitting right now on the computer. Oh, yeah. You can't. So Because oh. I, w- uh, I couldn't cast it to the TV. And I, w- I wish they had the ability to cast. But I may, send, I may send an email and see if I can add that feature on there. Well, I'm glad you brought this up. I'd like to just talk real quick about the quality of these Blu-rays. Um, when I first showed this movie to a few people, they said it was so dingy and murky and the whole full frame thing going on with this DVD that <clears throat> only existed when I got into these about, uh, I've been watching these movies for eight years or so and the Blu-ray is a new thing. So it's, you know, totally remastered high definition and it looks phenomenal compared to what you ever got before. You guys are so lucky you're watching it like this for the first time. I watched bullshit. Like, it looked like you pulled it out of a fucking swamp like the film. It, it, dude, I'm tell- it, was, it was a nightmare to watch. And I still, <laughs> you know, found enjoyment. You couldn't even see anything. It was so dark. And these Blu-rays, all three of them, I'm so glad they, they came out with these. And I, I don't even know if they came out with four or five yet, because I have zero interest in those, so I have no idea. Yeah, and I mean, the Blu-ray for Transfers 1 is only like 15 bucks. And, and I don't know, because it's like, like I said, I haven't really been into Full Moon movies since I was a teenager. So, like, back then, I was watching these movies on VHS. Oh, there is a Transfers 3-pack called the Squid Pack Slime Line. 
that's got one through three for 30 bucks. That's amazing. And I would have got it, but it, I already have them all on Blu-ray, so. But yeah. Everybody but, else, though, pick that up. 30 bucks, man. How can you go wrong? Yeah, 10 bucks a movie? That's worth. That's totally worth it. Uh, but the cool, the cool thing about the VHSs back in the day is that all the video zones and shit like that with the special features, once you got done watching the movie after the credits, they were there. Oh, wow. It was like the precursor to, you know, uh, when DVDs came out and you had the special features menu. They, uh, v- Full Moon had all that shit, and it was after the it was after the credits. So, what do you guys think of like M- McNulty and stuff like that? McNulty was cool. I, I I enjoyed the fact that when he got sent back to his ancestor, it was a little fucking ten year old girl or something. And how did, how does that pay off in the second movie, man? Isn't that awesome? Oh my god! The, the oh, when we get to the second movie, I wrote down some lines. Yeah, but when these people come back, the loyalty to this, I guess, franchise is phenomenal. Hey, just out of curiosity, because I know I recognize the guy. Does anybody know any other movies that uh, that they can think of off the top of their head that the 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 older McNulty was in? Uh. Because um, I know he's been in he's been in a bunch uh, of shit. He played Babe Ruth in the Sandlot. He was Captain Sears in Cobra. He was the pharmacist in the Blob. Okay, cool. Because um, <laughs> I was like, I know, I know that guy from a bunch of shit. Yeah, he's been in a bunch. Oh, of he shit. was in the Van Damme movie when he was locked up in prison. Uh, Death Warrant. I think I've only seen that like twice. Yeah, that's not one of my favorite of the Van Dams movies. No, not a favorite, but I, I try to watch it every, like, five years. I like the one where Stallone's locked up more. Yeah, I don't like that. Dude, I used to like that as a kid or something, so I, I wanted to revisit it as an adult, and I was like, wow, this is really not as amazing as it was when I was younger. I felt the same way about Cobra. Yeah? Wow. Yeah. I did. I don't, I don't like Cobra as an adult as much as I did as a kid. Nah, it's crazy. And right? with no surprise, I have not seen any of the movies they're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Me and Alex can do a show by ourselves on fucking uh, 80s cheesy action movies. Oh, yeah, dude. Well, I do one now. Uh, that's the other thing I do. Not to do this in the middle of our show, but, but I started a uh, an action uh, video commentary podcast. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's called the Hard to Kill Podcast. Are you serious? Yeah. <laughs> oh, dude. I, I'm totally, you're going to have to get me on there, man. All right. <laughs> yeah, it's I'm got all uh, about those old movies, bro. It's got Josh James from the uh, R-rated commentary podcast, or is it is it R-rated or rated R? Uh, R-rated, I believe. R-rated, uh, which is fantastic. I was on there uh, Friday Thirteenth Part Two, and then it's also got uh, Neil from NFW, and I've been on that show also. Uh, so yeah, it's hard to kill. You can watch a video version of it. Uh, they're usually put on archive.com <clears throat> and uh there's also the audio if you don't want to watch the movie because i don't know you're weird <laughs> <laughs> yeah i want to do one on van damme's hard target oh we did that that was our first episode oh i gotta listen i gotta listen that's so good man <laughs> i love that movie <laughs> that's funny all right so back on topic here does anyone else have anything else they want to say on the first trancers um i like the way the trancers looked um I do enjoy the progression of them, but I like the way the transfers looked. Um, that was pretty good. Um, I really dig the set pieces for the future because, like, the cars, for instance. Yeah, that opening scene, yeah. Right. You know what the cars kind of reminded me of? They kind of reminded me of the cars in Time Cop, mm-hmm. which I really, really liked. Um, so I dig The guy that. who worked on the cars in Transfers also did the cars in uh, Blade Runner. Oh, shit. Nice, nice. So, yeah, I really, really like that. The story itself, I like the fact that it's got a little bit of a happy ending. I think we're really going to start fleshing out the story in the second one, though. Oh, yeah. The second one really, really expands. Absolutely. I I love that Jack Death looks so different from 2247 to 1984. Like, he looked all skinny and scrawny and kind of weird. Uh, you know, but he had dark hairs, scars on his face. The the lighting was totally different. And in '85, it's all bright. He's big with the trench coat. He looks v- like virile, virile and uh, younger or whatever. But it's just they did a really good job of making it look like he truly is another guy, like a, an ancestor. 
Uh, yeah, but at the same time, I think it's funny that he's the only one that has the same likeness to himself from the yeah. future than anybody else. Yeah, right. He's the only one. Huh, I never even thought of that. Yeah, well, McNulty comes back as a 10-year-old girl. Well, that I know. <laughs> but, like, a- Alice Stilwell, I don't really know. We, which... ne- we never got to see what she looked like in the future. But I think uh, in, the, in the second one, she, she makes a point to say that she doesn't look the same. Right, yeah, because she says, she says uh, to Helen Hunt, you don't look like somebody who would do this. She goes, well, I don't know what you look like. You're in a different body. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Jack, you can't ignore the summons. It's the highest honor there is. The council needs you. Fuck them. Cahoonja Boulevard is. A what? What are you doing? Dry hairs for squids. Let's get out of here. Seemed like kind of an okay guy last night. Welcome to the 20th century, Jack Death. Nice tan. It's very Christmassy. Yeah, well, thanks. What kind of name is Jack Death? Beef. You like from a cow? That cotton candy is my lead, pal. She's going to take me right to Ashby. Is it true? But I lie. Very well. Right? It's a mistake. I've made my decision. Now it's up to fate. Well, Phil, I hope you enjoyed yourself again. Cheer up. You just sent your first transfer. You listening to me? The bomb, man. You are now happy. You're gonna dry out, get a job, meet a girl, and have a kid. His descendant's gonna be one of the greatest leaders in the 23rd century. I'm the one you want, not her. You're the one I shall have. Oh, yes, didn't you know? Destin marries the girl, or would have had she lived. And now I'm Jack Death. Prepare to witness your own demise. <laughs> you can't get home now. What are you going to do? That's okay. I kind of like it here. I mean, this right here, we could roll right on into the second one. Because yeah. that's the that's the crazy thing about the second one is damn when when she comes back, she she doesn't recognize Jack even though Jack because Jack looks damn near the same, he's the same likeness. It's just I, you know like you. I said, have but, an uh, explanation for that. Okay, tell me. Okay, so they actually state in the movie that she's been uh, when she came back to the past, she actually got stuck in a uh, body of a girl who was crazy and had been on a lot of drugs and medication and they actually mentioned jack actually mentions that her brain is still really really fuzzy from all the medication that she's being force fed that's why she doesn't she she doesn't really recognize uh uh jack at at first during the last six years i've spent a lot of time wandering this part of the california coast It's tough knowing it's all going to be under the ocean after the killer quakes of 2063. My name is Jack Death. I'm a cop for the future. Transfer you to. And I didn't know it yet, but back up the line, my old supervisor, McNulty, was on his way to see me. McNulty's a professional pain in the ass, but the council was stuck with him because, like me, he had an ancestor in old California. That's the only way to send someone's consciousness back in time over the genetic bridge. I hadn't learned about the TCL chamber yet. Trancers 2 from 1991. Jack is back. And he has to... He stayed in the past. He never went back to the future. He stays there with Lena and uh, hanging out with Hap Ashley or Ashby. Ashby. Him and uh, his wife Lena are now married and she wants to go find a house. But he's like, I've still got to protect Happy. He hasn't had a kid, so therefore I'm still on the job. Um, and at this point, you start to see that that over the six years there's been there's starting to be a little bit of issues and split problems happening. Jack and his wife Lena, which if you have the Blu-ray for Transfers One, there's a uh, short in there called Transfer City of Angels. Yes. It's about 30 minutes long. It was for a uh, it was a, for a movie that never came out. It doesn't necessarily add anything to the story except a female assassin 
uh, goes back in time to try to kill Jack out of revenge. The only important takeaway from that, that uh, little short, is the fact that Jack and Lena are having problems because Lena is fed up with Jack's shit. She think, he thinks he's being lazy and not putting enough time into making his detective agency work. He just wants to watch movies all the time. Sounds like a podcaster. Yeah, leave him alone. Yeah. Uh, so, but Jack realizes after, you know, defeating the assassin that he's got to make things right. So he asks when he gets sent back to the past that they send him a little bit early so that he can use his so that he can kiss Lena and be like, you're right, it's all okay. Best scene in that, though, is when he uses the long minute to yell at Lena when she can't hear it. <laughs> oh, yeah, and, yeah. Then, and then come back into it. I, well, oh, we I also see. get ha- Pash, uh, not half. we also get uh, our uh, detective in a little girl body again, which is always funny. Yeah, but I, I see, and I wish that I had that. And I may end up buying it just for that because that that actually answers my questions about some of my questions about the third one. But we'll get there when we get there. But uh, also, I don't want to leave out the fact the changes that are between the aside from that, the changes between the first one and the second one, like the fact that, you know, at the beginning of this one, uh, Hap is sober and he has managed to gain his fortune back. Yes, so so we can't uh, forget about that. (laughs) To continue the description of this movie, six years in the future, obviously uh, everything I said before, and they are staying at Hap Ashley's uh, house, which he has became very rich due to uh, great investments, and now collects fire trucks, because, you know, why not? Uh, When transfers show back up to try to kill Hap Ashby again. I think that's a, that's a good start there. Um, everything else we'll kind of go through as we talk about the actual movie. So, yes, Hap is sober. He is rich. He is doing super well. Lena and Jack are doing okay, but they're fighting. Lena wants to move out and get a house, and he he doesn't want to. Uh, more than that, dude. Yeah. She wants to have kids. Yeah. I thought we were talking about houses. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we do have McNulty coming back. Um, he says some things in the future that you shouldn't talk about. Like, uh, please don't grab your dick when you say nine year old girl. Like there's a scene where he's talking to, uh, Reigns, the, uh, black lady who does the injections. He's like, he says nine year old girl and then grabs his dick. And I'm just like, oh my God, stop. Uh, I, 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 I see. I think, I think that was more of a. Of because uh, at first I was like, eh, and then I was like, wait a minute, it's probably the fact that he doesn't have a penis. And uh, it, it was well, yeah, one of those he, things. He's you showing know what I'm that saying? it's Where missing he, when he goes there. Yeah, yeah, because he's just like, oh my god, you didn't have to come back in the body of a nine year old girl, and he's like, and he's checking, you know, because it's still there. I think, <laughs> I think, I think that was the biggest part of it, because you know what I'm saying. Can you imagine what that would be like? Yeah, I think it would be crazy <laughs> to be transferred into the body of a chick. Um, especially a chick my own age, because if I got transferred into like, you know, a hot chick in the twenties, I don't think I would leave it in front of the mirror. I know, dude. <laughs> I would be like clothes coming off, and I would just stand there and stare at my twenty-year-old hot chick body, and then I would think to myself all the things that I could gain with my hot chick body. Oh man, you, I would <laughs> own the world if I was a hot chick, man. Yeah, man. I, I, I dude, I'd have so much money. <laughs> Let's let's talk about you know we didn't give Ruthie her due in the first uh, movie so Ruthie is played by Telma Hopkins and she's the chick from Family Matters yeah yeah she's so hot I thought she was hot in Family Matters yeah and she comes back for three like I love the loyalty that every because you know not let's be realistic none of these people were getting paid a ton I'm sure they were all getting scale so probably. Yeah, so to come back for these, like, random weird movies that, you know, but then they will probably watch them, and I think whatever we all see in this, they saw in it, and they were like, yeah, you know what, this is something special. I, I, w- I want to continue my character. And that speaks volumes, especially in this movie, man. We got, obviously, Tim Thomerson. Helen Hunt comes back. Then you got... um McNulty, adult McNulty and girl McNulty both come back. And uh, Ruthie, all these people. 
By the way, the chick that plays Alice, you know she was in uh, Joe's apartment. Megan Ward? Yeah. Yeah, was she the main chick? Yeah, she was the one that Joe fell in love with. Wow. I love Joe's apartment. It's such a great movie. Yeah. yeah, so in this movie, our big bad guy is Whistler's brother, who has created new Trancers. Now, in the first movie, Trancers are created through a psychic connection with uh, Whistler. In this movie, they're created by a drug-based plant. The reefer. Plant- <laughs> yeah, a plant-based drug. Um, so that's very interesting. Uh, Alex and I were kind of talking about how, like, in the first movie, the only explanation we get for Trancers is from the troopers. And in this movie, it makes it seem like maybe the troopers really didn't know what a Trancer actually was and how it was done. Because in this movie, it's explained by a drug. In fact, they even mentioned that the, the drug is slightly based off of a uh, future version of of speed, I guess, in the yeah, future. They, yeah, they say something like that, yeah. Uh, so, which version is, of crack. Yeah, which is very, very interesting. Um, <laughs> They're all crackheads. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and then we jump to meet... Alice, who is in a psych ward, but the psych ward is run by a company called Green World, uh, and they will save you so you can save the planet. It would have been so much funnier if it would have been the future version of Bath Salt. Yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> I just, I'm sorry. I just went down this whole rabbit hole in my head of, you know, future crack, Bath Salts, you know, a bum eating <laughs> somebody's face off. <laughs> I just went through this whole thing, and I'm like, oh shit. Now, yeah. I want to say something that relates to the two of you. Richard Lynch is the main bad guy in this movie. Now, if Jerry walked up to him and the first thing he said was, were you a fire victim? He would actually be correct. <laughs> is that why he looks all fucked up? <laughs> <laughs> yes. He was actually in a fire. I was curious about that because I was sitting there and I was looking at him. I never really did any research on him, but I uh, saw some pictures of him when he was younger. And I was like, I was looking at it and I was like, man, that motherfucker didn't age well at all. (laughs) He did some living, man. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, that's some good drugs. Yeah. So this Alice character is actually Jack's uh, wife from the future who got sent back down the line the day before she was killed, as previously previously mentioned in the first movie, but because she goes back down the line and her ancestor is in a mental hospital, they don't hear from her for six months, which is why they send McNulty back to go find Jack. Uh, and Alice is, is there trying to convince this guy named Rabbit, who kind of looks like a... Uh, what's that dude's name? Uh, Ron Howard's brother, who's in a bunch of weird shit like Ice Cream Man. Kind of looks like him. Um, and there are two things I want to say about this mental hospital. One is you're a shitty mental hospital. Uh, if your drugs dissolve so well in water, as, as seen by Alice drugging the vodka for Rabbit and... Uh, Hey, uh, the chick Pearl. Uh, you would think you would make all of your people take it that way because I'm so tired of watching movies where there's a mental hospital and someone just hides a pill under their tongue and is able to take it out and fucking put it away. That is just <laughs> fucking annoying. It, it, it's a common issue that would happen in a mental hospital, and you'd think they would, you know, have that pretty figured out. Oh, no. In real mental hospitals, those orderlies will grab you by the fucking skull and <laughs> and push your cheeks open and open your fucking mouth. And if you don't stick your tongue out, they'll reach in there and grab it. And if you bite their fingers, they'll punch you in the face. <laughs> yeah, it's just a movie thing, Jerry. I mean, yeah. that, I mean that legit. That's exactly what they do. And if that doesn't work... The next thing you know, you feel the prick in some point in time, in some part of your body, and you are out. Yeah. So, an, a, <laughs> another thing I actually, and this literally is not a, it's a movie thing, but it, I can't, I, I, it kind of bothered me. Her conscious takes over the body, mm-hmm. but the body is sick. How come she's not affected by if, if, 
the ancestor is mentally unstable, has a chemical imbalance in her brain. Why would that not affect her? Much like if she came back and the body had a kidney stone, wouldn't she be in pain? Ooh. Her consciousness would just be affected by the dis- disorder of the brain. Yeah. So that's one, I will say, that to me, that's one of the biggest plot holes in this movie it, is that – but you can literally just throw it away and go, yeah, it was plot convenient to write her into a mental hospital as a way to keep her away from everybody for six months. It, it was an easy thing. But it works. It does make it interesting. It does put her right in the hands of the bad guys. It's a good way to bring Jack to the bad guys. So, Hey, what did you guys think about this whole subplot where Jack, Death, and Ruthie had a whole thing going on back you know, he's like... Oh, when, when they mentioned it in the first movie that uh, they had a one-night stand? Something like that. And then this guy mentioned it in, in this movie. He's like, listen, it's been great with Jack out of my hair for six years, but, you know, you and him, I... I... Y'all got a history. Yeah. That sort of doesn't go anywhere. Yeah, I think it's more just to give the characters a little bit of flavor. It kind of gives you a little backstory on her. Yeah. Show, yeah, it shows that she doesn't really care about the one-night stand. Plus, it doesn't matter anyway. Um... And I, we haven't brought this up yet, but Jack's body in the future has been calcified. Right. So he can no longer come back to that body. The body's basically useless. Okay, good. Now I can say what I was going to say. So it's useless. The only way to get Jack back is to put him in the TCL chamber, right? Well, what the hell about Phil? Like, aren't we essentially killing him? Like, what about his life and his future? They do the same thing to Alice's relative. Well, yeah, but who cares? Because she is a mental patient. That life has no value. Like, she's just going to stay in that asylum and then just die. It really doesn't matter. So that is a justification for why they could send Alice still well to part three and in that future. But to do it to Phil is fucked up. Because what about Phil's life? And, and if Phil's an ancestor, how is Jack going to be born? If Phil just disappears without having kids and then jacks him in the future. Well, another big plot hole brought to you by Alex. But to <laughs> quote Jack, death. The little girl in the third one was actually death's kid and she didn't tell him. Mm. Oh, that's a valid point. Yep, yep. Wow. Mm. That was so, it. Uh, yeah, Alice is uh, Jack's ex-wife. They, uh, McNulty doesn't really tell Jack this. He just says they sent, they sent a transfer on her back in time and she disappeared. And when Jack finds this out, it, it's fantastic. It's one of the best scenes in the movie. Jack, it makes the movie so interesting because now our love triangle is Jack with his two wives. Perfect. It is so great. And it's done so well because it puts you in a point, like... No matter whose position you're put in, it's completely understandable what like why someone would be mad. Mm-hmm. Jack's Jack can't okay. Jack Jack goes to tell his future wife, Alice, that first wife, future wife, I don't know how to say that. Um that the reason he's back in the past is because she's dead, and that's why he's in the past and married to Lena. But Alice doesn't want to know what happens in the future, and she specifically tells Jack, if you know the future, don't tell me. Now, Lena is in a position where she knows that in 48 hours, Alice is dead. She goes back to the future, dies a day later. So even in Lena's position where she knows how fucked up and how hard this is for Jack, she's still kind of like, I've had enough. She kind of tried to make it work, but couldn't, and she ends up actually uh dipping out for the movie which uh play well dipping out for a little bit in the movie which plays a good part later on but like just to sit and think about that to to really be like man that is just fucking insane well let's talk about how lucky the limo that oh what do you mean lucky He he, he wasn't getting a threesome from lena no dude listen to this lena's 28 at this point and he's 45 and this other chick is 22 years old, and she's begging him to have sex with her. So at 45 years old, you're getting a chick half your age. How hot is that? Valid point. God. She even says to him, you know, if we have sex, that'll clear up everything. <laughs> and, and essentially what is happening here 
your wife is telling you you can have sex with this hot young girl and it's okay because my brain is in her or consciousness how great is that uh, that would be like uh that would be almost as awesome as being in a relationship with somebody like mystique oh god and she could just be anyone you want for that exactly night. oh god i gotta hook up with her you know what's funny about the, that the, your whole thing? McNulty basically says the same thing when he's like, inside this teenage girl is a 44-year-old man. Right. Exactly. What Pretty hot guys... teenage girl. <laughs> yeah, she's uh, she's cute. I like that girl. Yeah. What did you guys think of the time travel in this movie with the new tap back uh, where they can now send a machine down that you can get in and go back so you don't actually have to transfer you don't have to go up the line back to the former body you so someone like jack who's stuck in the past could actually come back what did you guys think of that i think it it takes away from the things that we liked about the first one i mean don't get me wrong it adds depth to the story but at the same time i mean the, you're you're creating more easily seen plot holes that way and then i also think it adds to the dynamic of the stress of the movie for these people to be stuck in the past you know what i'm saying like she like at this point you know uh alice can't go back because if she goes back she's gonna die uh death can't go back because obviously he'd be leaving lena but at the same time you know he can't go back because his body's fucked up i mean I, i i like the dynamic that it adds to it you know, and I didn't like the fact that that all that that all that changed, especially when death doesn't really go back anyway. He doesn't go and stay. And the same thing with uh, in the third one. He doesn't you know what I'm saying? He doesn't go back and stay. So so I think it. Uh, well, yeah, we'll get into that. But uh, but I, I like the dynamic that it, that you're stuck because I think it adds more tension to the fact of, well, all this fucked up shit is going on and we can't do anything about it because we're stuck here. OK, well, what can we do while we're here? And then I, I, I think it I think it they, makes it more tension. They, I agree with you, but they do do a good job of not letting you think that Alice is just going to jump back in the pot and go back. Just because uh, McNulty and them mentioned that that uh, the pod is for Jack to come back. Right. But it's a two-person pod, isn't it? So it's supposed to be him and Whistler or something like that? Yeah, it's supposed to be him and uh, Whistler's brother. Yeah, but the door got fucked up. Yeah. So they do a good job of making you not go, oh, well, it doesn't matter. Alice can live because she can go back. You really don't – I like me personally when I was watching the movie, I never thought about that – you know, option up until Jack actually told them to go do that option. Hmm. So it, it, it's in hindsight, it affects the, the stress level of the movie. But while I was watching the movie, it never really crossed my mind. Let's also point out the fact that it, it actually adds because although Kenneth is technically correct, Jerry is too. And saying it never really changes any dynamics leading to that last final moment. So, it actually is kind of comforting as a fan if you actually began to like Alice Stillwell knowing that Jack's wife will not have to die. is actually pretty badass. And, again, like I said, she's a mental patient here. It doesn't matter if you're essentially killing her. Sending her there, it's like, oh, good, wow. So this whole thing hanging over our heads this whole time that Jack's wife... And that's a... That, well, I'll finish the sentence. That Jack's wife is going to be killed as soon as she goes back. Now, that's the other weird thing. It's like, why does she have to be killed as soon as she goes back? Like, why couldn't the technician who met her the day before say, listen, you're going to be killed here. This guy's going to kill you. Let's get you 100 miles away from here. Maybe because they're actively trying not to uh, alter the future. Alter the future. That's the only thing I could really think of is that there is a slight moral guideline right. that they're supposed to be following. Okay. Well, they're going against... Well, I guess these people just chose to go against it. Maybe the powers that be are not happy that Alice is actually coming back. Could be. They really they really just want Jack back. That's all they really care about is getting Jack back because he's the best. Hmm. Right. There's, it's all about using him. Yeah. So let's talk about the greatest scene of the entire history of film. Uh, what do you do when you get a ham that's stuffed like a turkey? <laughs> you pass the mustard. 
Exactly. There is a exploding ham scene in this movie. And it it's fucking awesome. And it even causes uh, Hap to start drinking again. Instantly. And he's drunk instantly. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, his tolerance is nothing. He downed an entire bottle of vodka. Ugh. Wait, but before... Listen, not that I don't want to explore the ham, but can we just go back and explore the first time we see a transfer in this movie? It's also when oh. Hap Ashby goes outside. So this one dude shows up to do landscaping. He has a bunch of trees that he has to bury into the lawn or whatever. And he's out there, he's waving to Hap. And then all of a sudden he goes, hey, where's your buddies? He's right there saying, where's your buddies? He goes, I don't need any stinking buddies. And he like swings his shovel at him and he's a trancer. And And then then his buddies show up. And they're right there. It's like, how the fuck do you not see these guys? They were right there. Yes, he drove in alone, which makes no sense. Yes, they weren't anywhere in sight at that moment. But as soon as... Jack rolls up in the golf cart and shoots this guy. Suddenly, there's two more guys just standing there. And I also want to say it's kind of weird because in this movie, uh, Green Planet and their leader don't actually seem like they give a shit about trying to kill Hap Ashby unless they're doing it for revenge, but they, it's never talked about whatsoever. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're right. There's they, no objective it, there. Their objective is to create more transfers because they're trying to take over the world. They really have no reason to fuck with Hap. In fact, fucking with Hap is what throws their fucking whole vision off. It ruins their plans because it gets Jack involved. And like I said, unless the leader wanted revenge for his brother, which is never said... It makes absolutely no sense for them to go fuck with Hap. Wow, I never even considered that. If they would have never fucked with Hap and just kept doing what they were doing, Jack Death would have never have known. They would have never found him. Even with the uh, uh, McNulty and Alice coming back to the past, they had no leads as to where Wesler's brother was. They had nothing. You just ruined the whole thing. Thanks, dude. <laughs> yes, I did it instead of Alex. Yeah. Hey, listen. Somebody else got to take the well, reins. Like once I said, in a while. you can easily explain it by saying uh, that the brother wants revenge or getting rid of nope. Hap is still an essential part of the plan. Damn it, Kenneth. Let me have this. Whole series ruined. That's it. We're done. Ah. Thanks for listening to Kill the Cast. Thanks for having me on after two years and ruining everything. Uh, guys, remember, I'm oh, on the Mayor of Children. Oh, yeah, right. The exploding <laughs> ham. <laughs> All is saved with exploding ham, which is pretty funny. I don't like ham. I'm going to be honest with you. Here's the thing. When that dude walks in from the deli and Jack sticks a gun in his face, Jack never loses suspicion just because, oh, come on, it's my deli guy. Jack really never lets his guard down in any major way. Then this idiot tips over the box <laughs> revealing the, the booze. And he's like, oh, come on, Hap. You've been you've been clean for whatever years, blah, blah. Uh, he's like, yeah, thanks, asshole. And the guy leaves. Now, does that mean this guy was a... Tr- oh, he was a transfer. Holy shit, what am I talking about? Because as soon as this all happens and the ham explodes, he comes in the doorway with this fucking weird, gripping, weird move in his arm. And he has a shotgun in the other hand thing. <laughs> I sent you the video, Jerry. Oh, yeah. It is the funniest scene in the movie. The, I will say this. The <laughs> gunplay in these movies is not very good. Uh, the third one being the absolute worst when it comes to gunplay. I don't um, I, I don't know. I think Death's gunplay got better in the third one. Re, there is a scene where he goes to shoot a body on the floor, and he's clearly aimed way too high to shoot the person in the back. That's true. Yeah. So, uh, so... Drunk Hap ends up stealing Jack's car, buys baseball stuff and a shit ton of booze, finds homeless people, and gets a game started. And while he's doing that, Jack and Alice uh, are discussing how Alice has only ever slept with Jack and they should fuck because it'll make everything better. But instead of doing that, they've got to go break up Green Planet, who are giving out hot dogs. Green World. 
yeah, Green World are giving out hot dogs, and if you say that you want some mustard or some relish, you get thrown in the back of a van. Yeah, how, how amazing is that? They're handing out cold hot dogs to all these homeless people, but if you happen to have a need for more, they, they deem you worthy of being a transfer. How bizarre. What is the thought process here? They've got enough fucking strength inside them to question and be like, God damn it, I want some motherfucking mustard. But that doesn't make any sense with the first one because in the first movie they need weak-willed people. Right. Yeah, but at this point we've already established who gives a shit about the first one. Oh, yeah, that's a valid point. <laughs> I mean, I mean, because now after, we're, we're past that because now, you know, you've got a drug that makes them fucking goddamn extenuate versus having a weak mind. You know, so basically what you're doing is you're fucking giving them, you know, uh, steroid crack. And, uh, you know, I would imagine that it... I would imagine it probably wouldn't work as well with uh, with one of those uh, weak minded people in the first one, because, damn, you know what I'm saying? If you're if you're still lazy and weak, steroids really are going to do a whole lot for you. Here's the thing, though. In part three, he says to that chick, R.J. Garrett, Garrett. Yeah. He says to her, you can't be trans. Only squids could be trans. You're too strong minded or whatever. So. By your theory, I, I love your theory, by the way. I think it's great. Like, people who actually would question they're worthy, you know? Actually, Alex, uh, to combat your theory and agree with Kenneth on accident, uh, Trooper Death is going off the what he believes that the trances are in the first movie, that they're being, psycho, they're being controlled uh, mentally, which you have to have a weak mind for. But in the second or third movie, it's all based on drugs, which means that you actually don't have to be a weak-willed person. You could be a strong person and still get hooked on there. Now, in the third movie, they do try to get uh, military people who are, you know, usually trained to say, yes, sir, no, sir, do exactly what you're fucking told. And I still think it doesn't make exact sense to get the rambunctious homeless people, but their minds are also crippled by alcohol. So technically, they're still weak-willed, but they've got enough fire in them to ask for mustard and, and pop off the mouth that with a little bit of alcohol and a whole lot of future crack, they would make good transfers. I think I took both your theories, combined them, and made them work. Now you have redeemed yourself, sir. Finally. I'm worth a damn. You know why they call me rabbit? <laughs> this is the stupidest line in the fuck me. Oh, they call me rabbit because I used to just run in front of cars. Wouldn't they call you a dog or something then? A Why deer? a rabbit? Like, a deer? Yeah, a deer. Let's yeah. call him deer. <laughs> yeah, it makes no fucking sense. Um, oh, real quick, I want to talk about Jeffrey Combs, who's in this movie. Uh, <laughs> who's dressed uh, like a badass, but is not a badass. Like, throughout most of the movie, he seems like a badass, and then he just gets put in his place by uh, Wexler's brother. Who isn't I still that, can't remember his fucking name. Isn't that Jeffrey written. Combs in just about every movie that he's in? <laughs> you know, I think Reanimator is about the only movie where he's really badass in. I mean, look at his character in The Frighteners, man. He tries to be a badass, and then he's not. Yeah, yeah. Same with <laughs> the, uh, the Beyond. The character's really not that much of a badass. He's exactly. Like, he's broken. He always teeters <laughs> on badass, but yeah, never really... C- We've got a hot dog shootout that ends up leading us to the drunken baseball place where I'm glad to say Hap can still throw a beer bottle. Oh, yeah, Ooh. he really still can. You know, yeah. that was the okay. climax of part one that we never really talked about. Yeah, we kind of let the climax. Isn't that weird? We didn't even talk about the whole finale of it. I don't I think we left a little <laughs> bit of mystery for the people to watch. <laughs> yeah, we want you guys to watch it. Don't listen to us only. Watch it, too. Yeah, this should be more like watch the movies while you're listening to this podcast, because <laughs> to me, it seems more like the further we get along, it's more like a commentary. <laughs> yeah, well, with, the, with the ending of the first one, it's kind of the ending is nothing great. The ending is, is exactly what it should be. It's kind of basic. So it, it's not very exciting to talk about. It's so just a guy we, getting a what's that? Uh, no, so what about a guy getting what? Who, oh, a guy getting a ball thrown at him, falling off a roof, and oh yeah, I had to strongly think about the ending of the first one just now, like before it came to my head, and I'm like, oh okay, now I remember. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, back to Wexler's brother, whose name is Wardo, Doctor Wardo, Doctor E. D. Wardo, e. D. Wardo. <laughs> which I thought was hilarious. 
ED Wardo, Eduardo. Oh, I thought it was erectile dysfunction Wardo. <laughs> <laughs> Either wow. way, you put it together and it comes out. I'm, uh, I'm just like, what are, you, what are you thinking when you put ED Wardo together? They had to be something. It's like Dr. Acula. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There you go. It, it had to. <laughs> there had to have been something like that. Has to be a reference to like a producer or something like that. You know, like Eduardo something or something. There has to be. It's got to be in there somewhere. Maybe. Uh, so Lena's at uh, a train station or airport or some shit, and she's gonna dip, gonna go on a mini vacation to get away from Jack and his future wife. Jack, you son of a bitch. Yeah. Uh, while there, she sees the people from Green World and calls Jack, lets him know, but. They kidnap her, and now not only are they going to turn Lena into a trancer because they want Jack to see his wife become a trancer just before he dies, they also turn poor Rabbit. Yeah. Not the Rabbit. Can you imagine if Lena became a trancer? How, like, horrible would that be? It would be such a dark movie. <laughs> oh, my God, yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, they decide they are going to break in, save Lena, and burn the plants. And that's what they do. But then they kill. But then Rabbit gets killed. You bastards! Not Rabbit. Everyone liked that character. Am I sarcasm too much? Sorry yeah, I understand. Like he's not. It's weird. He's not. Um, you don't hate him, but he's not like a likable character in the yeah, sense. Yeah, you don't really care. Right. He's like a weird guy that you don't care about. Just yeah. out of curiosity. Okay, the burning of the plants, would that have really been a good thing? That's like, you know, when you hear these stories of cops finding like fucking three, four hundred thousand whatever pounds of reefer. <laughs> and, and they, they just like, to get rid of it, let's burn it. And everybody stands near it. I, I mean, you know, I would be out there with a blanket huffing <laughs> over the top of the fire, you know. And, and, and it kind of reminds me of the same thing. You know, it's like the next thing you know, we're going to have a fucking Trancers Return of the Living Dead mashup. Ooh, I want to see that. <laughs> you know, where you've got, where they burn the plants and all the shit goes out into the forest and the next thing you know, you guys are coming out it of all, nowhere. Uh, all the smoke goes into the, the nightclub from the first movie. Yeah. I mean, you know, that's the reason why I'm saying I mean, don't, I don't think it'd be a good idea to burn it. How about Probably, just, throw some, just throw some weed killer on it, you know? Burning that Scurb 78. What are you guys, crazy? Yeah, for real. <laughs> Uh, one of the best scenes in this movie is when uh, Wardo goes, can you hear me, Jack, or you're already dead? And his answer is to fucking fire a gun. Shoot at him. Yeah, he's like, can you hear my fucking gun, buddy? And just lets one go on them. It's so good. Um, did, you, did you guys notice, uh, uh, and I have to say this before, before I stop thinking about it, did y'all notice that while watching this movie, a lot of the scenes where there's a lot of dialogue, the actors were looking directly at the camera? No. Yeah. I didn't notice that at all. Yeah, if you go back and you, like, there's a there's an instance where, um, da, 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 it might be right before the ham scene, where, where they're in there, and the actors, you know, most of the time when we're watching other movies and you have dialogue scenes where you've got close-ups of the characters whatever they're still not looking directly at the camera lens it's kind of off if you go back and you watch that they're looking at the, directly at the camera a lot of times and it, it, it really started irritating me interesting because like you know once they start looking at the camera you know it it, it goes from being something that's serious to one of those uh, uh, jerry described it in one of our other podcasts that we did where somebody looked at the camera Oh, yeah, when you're breaking the fourth wall and winking to the audience, yeah, it takes you out of the movie. Even though I, even though I, I don't think they were purposely doing that in this, it still put me in that position where that's what I was thinking. And, and, it, and it, start, it really started to bother me. And at the end of the third one, death does it specifically. But it, it really started getting on my nerves. I was like, oh, my God. It, it, so, yeah, when you go back and watch it, look for that. I think it's just shitty cinematography. Could be. Um, what y'all think about the old exploding car trick that uh, was used in Predator being used here? Yeah, yeah, the, not the same. And dude, it's so funny because when the when the truck hits the barn, it's like so cheap or something. It's weird because this movie. Uh, listen, I love this movie. I'll say that right off the bat. But there is an underlying cheapness to this movie. I don't. I can't really put my finger on it. It's probably the sound effects. It's probably the stunts, the action, you know, whatever. 
the probably the flammable liquid that you can see clearly on the barn door before the truck hits it. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. There's there's like this weird like even when Jack and and um, who was he with? Uh, oh, Alice. When they drive over and they hit the guys with their truck when they're selling the hot dogs and stuff. That scene, and then even the shooting scenes here, like the sound effects. I gotta say, like, although it's it's clearly technically cheap in in that sense, and that's obvious budget, so we're not gonna hold them, you know. And I could not find it. I found budget for the for one and three. I could not find a budget for this movie. Hmm. See, this is the one I'm most curious about, actually. Yeah, because budget for the first movie is four hundred thousand. Budget for the third movie is two hundred thousand. Oh, mm-hmm. wow! You know what else is crazy on this one? If you if you subscribe to the uh, Amazon Full Moon channel on Amazon Prime, this is the only one out of the Transfer series that you can't stream. Oh wow! You have to rent it. Hmm. So you pay six ninety nine for that channel. You watch the first one, the third one, and the rest of the sequel. They're still paying cannot. off Helen Hunt. So you can't do it on the second one, but on the Full Moon direct Full Moon streaming site online, you can watch all of them. They're trying to get money to make up and add sound effects for the new releases that they're going to do in, in 2025. <laughs> but wait, I was going to say real quick, uh, on that note, I kind of feel it sort of makes it more realistic. You know, like in the sense that that is how you would hit somebody with a car. It wouldn't be so extra. You know, that's in movies. Um, the, the, the gunshot effects, the sounds in that last battle at the barn and all that, like the greenhouse, like it wouldn't be... Hollywood. It, that's how it would be. So, do you guys feel that that, in a strange way, adds? As weird as that sounds? Um, I'll say this. I, I never was taken out of this movie, so I, the thought never crossed my mind whether something was adding or taking away to the movie, because I was I was so involved in it. Um, so I, I, I really don't know. I'd have to watch it again, with that thought in mind to really look at that because I just don't know. And as for the gunfire stuff, I would have to go to Kenneth to ask Kenneth if this is what a gun shootout is like because he's our resident gun expert. Um, Unless you're actually, and this goes for most of your Hollywood movies, unless you're actually firing the gun, it does not sound like that in real life. You know, that uh, a lot of times, depending on the movie, you know what I'm saying? A lot of times they'll have that real deep sound. And the only time it sounds like that is when you're actually the one firing. If you're three or four feet away standing behind the person, it doesn't sound like that. It sounds more like a firecracker. Yeah. So okay. there you go. So my theory might be right. Yeah. So uh, speaking of expertise, Kenneth, you're a resident uh, pitchfork expert also. <laughs> uh, Citing your prowler. How do you feel about Jack Sabir and Wardo with a fucking pitchfork? You can clearly see when he falls down, his body shifts, and those tines on that pitchfork would be broken had his body shifted that way. You can clearly see it. See, that's why I have you here. You bring the important stuff <laughs> to the table. I mean, I wasn't going to say anything, but you asked. <laughs> oh, you I know. had to. It's a pitchfork. Anytime there's a pitchfork, I have to bring it. I gotta, yeah, I gotta have that throwback. Friday three, you, yeah, you can totally see it. And 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 the funny thing I think about the way this this scene is shot is it's like you know the way the camera is done because you know and you see you see him you see Wesler and he's got a or Eduardo you see it you see Wardo he's got a gun then it pans to death death throws the thing and then it goes back to him and there's no gun there's a pitchfork in him <laughs> <laughs> you know i love the cheapness of that because you know obviously they're not going to be able to actually show the pitchfork going into right, him right right yeah of course i love the cheapness of that it was fantastic yeah can we can we back up to one thing though jerry i don't want to miss this what do you guys think of this this amazing escape plan of theirs to get out of this oh yeah Fantastic! Look like a, sm- a, a small version of the end of Tremors. <laughs> I'm just trying to figure out what guns couldn't shoot through that. What were they thinking? And then, like, they just get up out of it and shoot the people. It's like, how does, <laughs> like, 14 guys couldn't land one fucking bullet in the head of any one of the three of them? As this series goes on, it seems to get, its action seems to get more ridiculous 
And and this is a clear, clear piece of evidence for that theory. Horrible idea. I mean, because yeah. that, that literally was the first thing that I thought about. I was like, this looks like a fucking mini version of Tremors. <laughs> Because that's exactly what it looks like. You know, you got a tractor pulling this this fucking, you know, metal bin with people in the bottom of it. And then they and then you're right. But, you know, it just kind of makes me think about Rambo, how Rambo hardly ever gets shot. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's fucking Rambo. I mean, no matter what movie it is, you got a whole bunch of cops shooting at him in the first one. He hardly ever. I don't even think he gets shot in the first one. In the second one, you got, you, you know, you got a bunch of Vietnamese guys shooting at him. He doesn't ever get really good shot. You know, yeah, and then if you want to the, hit Stallone, you you have to wait till he's playing Rocky. He'll take and then, all the hits then. In the third one, you got a shit ton of fucking Russians trying to kill him, and the only thing that gets that hits him is shrapnel. <laughs> you know, I mean, you got bullets flying everywhere, explosions, all kinds of shit, oh, yeah. and it's a piece of fucking wood from a blown up goddamn uh, post inside <laughs> this. Post. That's what hits him. Yeah. Yeah. So the ending of this movie has Jack finally explaining to Alice how she she's gonna is, die, man. She's gonna die in his arms, and he doesn't want that. And she's got a new body, and she could go back, and she does. And we then see Jack and Lena getting back together, buying a house, and another uh, when Hap is asked by the realtor what Jack does. He says, well, Jack is a fortune teller, which is a line from the first movie we really didn't bring up because it doesn't pop in that movie. But in the second movie, the line pops because it's it's throwing back. Um, <clears throat> all in all, the movie is good. It is a fun, entertaining movie. The original is better to me because the villain seems very weak in this movie. And while the villain wasn't as big in the first one either there was still a personal connection there yeah he wasn't big in the first one yeah but but there was that personal connection and he wasn't ridiculous like fucking ed wardo so it just it just works way better uh in this movie ed wardo seems way less of a threat even though technically he's got way more fucking transfers um but all in all i was glad to have jack back and i I was stoked to watch another movie with him because let's be honest that's the whole reason we're here is to see Jack. Oh, and the layers with Alina and the yeah, the love triangle in this movie was fantastic. Perfect and is one of the most unique ones I've ever had to think about. Oh God, yeah. What what other? There is no circumstance like this. <laughs> like it's it's fascinating. I, I like how he says, "Listen, just put up with this for like forty eight hours." And she's like, "What? Listen, I had to put up with a lot of shit dating a guy from the future, but this is a little too much." You know, like it, it's it's a fascinating love triangle, and I love uh, one of you mentioned that you could sympathize with any one of the characters. Yep, any one. What would you do if you were Jack? What would you do if you were Alice? What would you do if you were Lena? I think it would be fucked up to be in Lena's position, but at the same time, I think she could have been a little bit more understanding because of the fact of, you know, I mean, I mean, think about that. Think about how thick that is. I mean, it's just like you haven't seen your dead wife that you were in love with and and however many years there is between this and and all of a sudden she's there. I mean, it's just like, you know, at some point in time, you got to step outside yourself and be like, OK, well, what is this doing to Jack? Hmm. Because he's caught in between, you know, his current wife and his dead wife. I mean, yep. at that current moment, I mean, it's just like, you know, if you if you haven't seen somebody that that is dead, that was extremely important in your life, whether it be wife, family member, whoever it is. And then all of a sudden you see them again. I mean, I can I, I mean, you could do a whole movie just based on that. And especially for Alice, it's been six months for Jack. It's been six years. Right. I mean, there's a there's a lot a lot of stuff that's involved in that just in that not just the love triangle itself but if you want to get deep in it there's a there's a lot of emotional baggage that's involved in that whole fucking scenario and they played it right they played it enough for this movie we'll never say they didn't do enough and they didn't go too far and so like there were instances where i'm looking at it and it's like i i almost felt more sympathetic 
towards Jack than anybody else because he's having to deal with this whole scenario and and um you know he there are instances where we see you know Alice doing her thing where it seems like she's trying to connive the whole situation which is which is justified and then you've got the other part of it with Lena where I think there's certain instances where she's being too much like oh he's just cheating on me because it's a lot bigger than that yeah Alice was a little cruel at one point. Right. When she was kind of like, get lost, you're just a distraction. You know, listen, I love the character of Alice still well. I love her. It's great to see her again in the next movie and stuff. But I have to play the devil's advocate or whatever whatever it takes to see her point of view at that moment when she was being cruel to the other, other character I really like, which is Lena. You know, you got to see it from her point of view, though. You know, so it's kind of forgivable, and you don't really think that she's just like a bitch. And see, that's the reason why it's just like you know, that's the reason why I'm more sympathetic to Jack than anybody else, because you got this whole thing going on between these people, and Jack is caught right in the middle, and I can't even imagine what he feels like, because he's not, you know, you know, she hadn't seen him in six months. Well, fuck, he hasn't seen. He thought she was dead. You know, it's like you know somebody coming back to life after six years of grieving and, and and dealing with that, and then you know finding somebody new and having to deal with the fact. Well, oh my God, I'm getting you know my ex wife comes back to life, and then I've got this new wife, and blah blah blah. I mean, I can't, I, dude, I can't even imagine to begin what that whole thing felt like. It's super deep. Yeah. Me again. Back down the line in 1985. You don't know what it was like the last time, waking up in the body of a nine-year-old girl. He's been gone too long. His body here in the present is calcified. His only way back to this world is in his new body in the TCL chamber. It's either that or he'll spend the rest of his life in the past. Helpers, I don't need any stinking helpers. So that means the stuff they're sending down the line is going to wind up in the middle of the goddamn yard. Yeah, right in the middle of the goddamn yard. They're not going to let you loonies wear no watch. Now, I thought you were smart enough to know I'm not one of these loonies. You may talk smarter than most of them, but I'm used to a lot of smart talk. You've come to Green World because your body is like the planet, polluted with toxic chemicals. Your mind is sick. You don't know what to do. We'll save you. Bitch, yeah. Sounds like he's creating a transfer for him. You seem to forget that inside this teenage girl's body is a 42-year-old tough cop. Yeah? While you're a girl, McNulty, why not try and act like a lady? I'm a special agent on a mission from the future. I know just how you feel. <laughs> Welcome to old California, Alice. I'm your husband. Jack Death. Oh my God, Jack, it is you. The only man I ever had sex with. Jack, you son of a bitch. If I catch you kissing that teenager again, I'll kick your ass. Hey, Jack, what's with this ham? It's, it's stuffed like a turkey. God damn it, McNulty. The next time someone hands you an exploding ham, I'm going to pass the mustard. Jack, you son of a bitch. Lena, don't jump to conclusions you're the one doing all the jumping jack why does she keep butting in on us because i happen to be his wife so am i ladies please this ain't no way to serve a hot dog what's your problem bub for one thing when i eat a dog i want a little mustard on it can you hear me jack are you already dead Jack, please don't go. I'm not going back, McNulty. What? And give up a seat on the council? Do you know what that means? It's like being king of the universe. You stay here, you're just a transfer hunter with no way home. Lena's my home. But now we move on to Transfers 3, which came out October 14th, 1992, with a budget of $200,000. That's right, it came out on my fourth birthday. Suck it. Wow, uh -huh. that's super low. So, 1984, it was $400,000. And by 1990, what, three? Two. Two? It's half of that. Yep. 
That's bizarre. My name is Jack Depp, and I'm a transfer hunter. I work in Los Angeles, California. In the year 2360, at least I did until I traveled through time to send a transfer nutcase who was running wild in the streets of old L.A. Now I'm stuck in the city of angels. That's not too bad. I found a girl and work as a private eye. But I'm still a future cop with no transfers to burn and no new cases in sight. And, uh... Jack Death is also doing pretty bad here. He uh, makes a shitty commercial to try to drum up business, even offering you a free camcorder. Uh, it looks like they're, it, Lena wants to get a divorce from him. It, it's not looking good. Um, and it's also not looking good for a store that's getting robbed. But an alien shows up, I guess. Uh, turns out it's an android. You find out later on. But at the beginning, I thought it was an alien. And my God, the mask uh, or makeup or whatever it is on uh, the android shark's head looks fantastic. <laughs> well, I know you'd like him because he was called Godzilla the whole time. <laughs> Even though he didn't look anything like, he looked more fish-like than reptile-like. Yeah, that's what that's what I was going with it. He was called Godzilla. But yet he looked like a shark. <laughs> he should have been called Jaws. The best for of both worlds for Jerry. That's true. You guys know who played him, right? No. No. The, the dude who played Leatherface in Texas Chainsaw 3. Really? R.H. Melioff, or whatever his name is. Nice. This movie we have... Christmas. <laughs> yeah. The Christmas, once again. The council sends this uh, android named Shark to the past to bring Jack Death back to the future so that Jack Death can go back and destroy the transit program because now it's being done on a mass scale and people are getting fucking murdered by the thousands in the future as we see Jack Death come back to basically the people he used to know are now holed up in a building that's destroyed and filled with it looks like when you uh, look at like photos from like the Vietnam War it's Terminator part one when uh, this dude has the flashback John Connor it's exactly that scene yep oh okay it's identical like oh, like literally except for uh, this guy's no Jim Cameron <laughs> and uh, Charles Ban actually didn't direct this either so Nope, some other guy, C. Courtney something, directed it. Right. So you didn't even get the uh, same feel, I guess, as the last two. But I didn't notice that, really, for the most part. And we do not have McNulty this time, because he died. He was killed in one of the very first firefights against the Trancer army. And he said he was retiring in part two. Yep. He didn't want to go down the line. Yeah, he said, oh, whoa, 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 hey, listen, I'm retiring and whatever, whatever. And now he's dead. Alice is running things up top now, uh, along with another guy that I can't remember his fucking name. Anybody remember the other guy's name? Hollis or something like that? Harris? Oh, yeah. I think Harris, yeah. Harris and uh, Alice are running things up top now, and they tell him, look, you have to go back to 2005. Find Lena because she knows who the, or who's creating all these transfers. She knows the OG. Mm -hmm. uh, we found it in her notes. You have to do this. So... Instead of going all the way back to where he was, he gets into 2005, which means Lena does not know what happened to him for over 13 years. All right, can we just get into this? Like, I know this isn't a girly show or anything, but I do want to tap into, like, the sadness of what's happening here with Jack's relationship. Uh, Helen Hunt is hanging on. Oh, sorry. Lena's hanging on by a thread at this point. You know, that phone call, she's going to call, you know, the lawyer's going to be there any minute, and they're going to, she wants to get this over with, and he's like, listen, let's have dinner, blah, blah, you know, like, uh, blah, blah, send this guy home, I, uh, I really think that after this, we're going to be good, blah, blah, she agrees, like, they have a last lingering hope of having this great relationship that we all know and love for two movies, to continue and it's great to hear that you know because we love Jack and we we really love Lena I mean I do so that now it's how sad is it that literally 
she when she says the line, you, you never showed up to dinner, and then one day I woke up and I was a year older. Yeah, it's it's a devastating line, especially when you okay. So in this movie, Lena hints that she is married to a new person, um, and it and you would assume that the child is that person's. But like Kenneth brought up earlier, technically you don't know if it's Jack Death's child. Right. It was the kid thirteen or roughly. It looks like it. Yeah, looked like it. She she was somewhere in the eleven to thirteen years of age. Had to be. Yeah. Um. So, it's right. It's it's a kind of devastating thing for Lena. But Lena seems to be doing well for herself. She's over it. She has moved on to a more normal life as an investigative journalist. Oh yeah, what a wonderful life. Hey, in the in the in 2005, man, that was popping. You you were you were fucking writing about uh, George Bush taking down the two towers. It was a fun time. Oh yeah, unless you were writing about the fucking 9/11 being a hoax. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we then cut to our villain in this movie. Uh, well, not really the villain, but his his henchman. Uh, we've got Marines at a bar that are getting a little oh, wait, out of control. Wait, dude, I'm sorry. I, I have to say this right now. I'm looking through the cast. There's a guy and his, you know, like I just looked up Stevens, you know, the guy who goes out of control in the bar and, and kills these guys. Yeah. There's another guy and he's listed as scumbag. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead. You got to love IMDb. Fun. Yeah. So they are, uh... Some kind of soldiers who uh, talk about this drug they take to make them super soldiers. And one of them gets out of control, trances out on, on a level 10, beats up some rednecks, and stabs him with a fucking pool stick. Uh, <laughs> refuses to calm down and eventually gets shot the fuck up by by men in black suits, by... by uh, a form of men in black. It could Here be. come the men in black. Yeah, exactly. So, turns out these super soldiers are being turned into soldiers featuring a drug uh, that is something like the one in the second one because it causes them to trance out, but they figured out how to w- make it happen in stages. Yeah, levels. Yeah, so you can trance out harder, uh, but it gets very hard to control, and that's what they're working on trying to uh, train them to do. And it's almost like a secret black ops CIA kind of thing. Um, And it's ran by Daddy Mudda. (laughs) Kinky name. Uh, And he's played by Larry from Hellraiser. With a southern accent. They wrote this this, uh, character just for him. Yeah, and every time he talks, he's sweating and comes off very rapey. (laughs) Um, How about that scene with him and the chicken bed, man? Yeah, okay. What is up with this movie? How sexual this movie is. Oh, so I, I love the fact that we finally got to see some form of nudity in a Trancers movie. <laughs> well, you didn't get any real nudity. As I said some form. I mean, you know, the the stripper chick with pasties on in the fucking bar, that was enough for me. I was like, woo, finally some tits. It just seems like, okay, I, uh, this movie to me feels like they wanted to make a more grandiose uh, version of the second movie. But instead of it coming off of this big epic thing, to me it just came off like really cheap and sleazy. It came off more as a low-budget VHS rental than any of the other movies had. It it, it just... It's got a weak script. The dialogue isn't that great. It just doesn't feel as personal as one and two. Well, we like, tits. once you get past the Lena thing... <laughs> we got tits. But you, yeah, I, I mean, yeah, you got tits. And there's a guy who looks at a slut magazine with a magnifying glass. Yeah, that so was there's weird. that. Um, I can honestly say, I ain't even involved in all my weird shit, I've never looked at a fucking nudie mag with a magnifying glass. Yeah, I'm into some weird shit, too, and I still never did that. Yeah, that's that's even beyond me. I would, I would fuck a corpse, but I'm not going to do that. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, and they also hide their secret military base in a strip club. <laughs> Woo! What better way to go? So you've got uh, Ryan and Jana, who are the I guess the highest ups of the Trancer Corps, and uh, they have a new recruit uh, in R.J. Garrett, who's only level one. 
But after seeing a uh, big dumb fuck uh, freak out, yeah, Stevens do all that, she actually abandons them, finds Lena, hides out there, and gives Lena the information for her to write her stories, uh, which causes them to, you know, of course, try to find her, where we also have uh, Jack finding Lena, finding out all the stuff that uh, Alex recently talked about. Him and uh, RJ Garrett leave. Uh, and I want to talk about this beach scene. Uh, once again, it feels like they're trying to make it intimate, but it doesn't work. They're too guarded off from each other. It, it doesn't It doesn't really work. And it's interrupted by a police officer that shows up that, um, oddly enough, looks like she places a tracker on the car, but it's never brought up. It's never sh- talked about. It's never... Like and she leans over and puts something like under the the uh, the part of the car that's that's curved above the tire. I don't know what that's called. Uh, the wheel well. Wheel well. She looks like she puts something there, which explains how they find uh, them moments later when they after R.J. Garrett kills her and they drive away. They literally find them a moment later because of that tracker. But it's never, it's barely shown, it's rarely seen. And at first I was like, man, this is a very, like, you would almost be like, uh, how did they find them if you missed one, like, second scene? I've missed that scene for eight years. Yeah, so did you ever question how they found? I don't know, I guess not. I never paid attention to the fact that she did that. I just thought, you know, she was getting freaky with the uh, with the car, you know. Well, this movie is very sexual so it is possible i mean she was hot man i mean i've seen uh, i've seen one of those you know my strange addiction shows where this dude had sex with his car he had sex with the gas tank right or the uh, muffler i don't know exactly they didn't go into detail of exactly how he did it but apparently he told his parents that he had had sex with his car and his parents looked at him like he was a nut job why just leave him alone, man. I mean, he literally was in love with his car. I mean, like, for real. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Like, well, he, things? he would be cleaning his car, and yeah. Speaking of cleaning what, were you just... Uh, I was trying to find any way to get out of someone's car. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because I don't want to get into Lena, Lena saying, Jack, you love that car more than you love me, and now I'm thinking about Jack fucking the car. Mm. I don't like By where the this way, is going. Speaking of clean hair... Uh, there was a scene at the beginning of Trancers 2 that I almost forgot to tell y'all about. Do y'all remember at the beginning of, the, of Trancers 2 when his hair wasn't wet? Oh, yeah, and I was wondering why he was willing to do that since he thinks that's for squids. Yeah, and then I was thinking, oh, my God, after he said that in the first one, is this whole movie going to be? And then, no, he put that shit in his hair, and I was like, yeah, there we go, there's Jack. Yeah, it's funny because well, when they were driving in the beginning, right, or something like that? Yeah. They probably wanted his hair to blow in the wind because they're trying to create that illusion. Meanwhile, <clears throat> I hate to burst this bubble, but every time Jack and Lena are in that car, it is clearly on a flatbed, and it's like three feet higher than they would be if they were on the concrete. It is so obvious every time. I've never paid it any mind, but thanks for ruining that for me. Way to go. We were we were almost through a movie without <laughs> ruining it. <laughs> And damn it, you ruined this, the other one while we're in the middle of trying not to ruin this one. <laughs> I went back to ruin a movie. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Daddy Mudda uh, is going to have a, a <laughs> senator <laughs> come and talk to him. And there's a great scene where Daddy Mudda uh, <laughs> is talking to uh, Jason. Having and Jason. sex with that one chick and her veins are all popping out on her face and shit. Oh, yeah. You never fucked a Nirvana fan? Um, no, but I was actually talking about the scene where, uh, because I really don't want to talk. No one should talk (laughs) about the scene where him and that chick, because you need to watch that scene. It is the creepiest, fucking cringiest scene ever. Uh, let's compare it to the Jason X sex scene and then say that again, Jerry. Go ahead. This is cringier. He's so sweaty. It's gross. Like I said, I was kind of erect either way. Her body is flawless. Uh, and I'm not even into her. Like, I don't think about her or, or anything, but... All right, so, uh... <laughs> Daddy Mudda's talking to Jason about, uh... 
the difference between simulation and being in live combat. And it's a great scene because you're kind of sitting there waiting for Jason to die. Yeah, right. And and, he, and Jason has his gun ready to shoot. And, like, you think you're going to get this fight scene and, and you don't. It's it's one of the better scenes in the movie. Um, And then we go to uh, Daddy Mudda and Jason showing the senator a fight between Ryan and his little brother, who is literally like a transfer level one. And Ryan, can you believe what happened here? Holy shit! So they start fighting, and Ryan is beating the shit out of his brother. His brother won't fight back. Ryan literally rips his little brother's fucking throat out while while in transfer level something mode. And the way that the daddy mutta is talking to the senator about using the transfers to take back the city in the streets. He literally sounds like he's fucking talking to the KKK. <laughs> uh, yeah, so he kills his brother. It's an exhibition. Like, this is nothing. Yeah, how is killing someone in front of the senator going to make the senator want to give you more money to protect the world? <laughs> because if that brother is willing to kill his... Uh, if that guy is willing to kill his brother under orders with the sh- and the strength that he has, then that shows how strong of a weapon they can be. Yeah, but does that senator even know that? He does now. That that gets ruined very quickly once the senator realizes how uncontrollable all of this is when RJ lets loose um, uh, fucking Jack Death and then RJ shoots the shit out of poor little Jason. Yeah. Man, man. Dead, dead. Yeah, and then he's gone. And then we have the worst gunplay I have ever seen in a fucking movie with the escape. It is just bad. I, I, I just cannot see a saving grace in this. None of the gunshots look like they're pointing in the right direction. All the gunshots are really slow. Like, they take their time to aim and shoot properly and all this shit. And it makes it just not feel exciting. It's just kind of like, <clears throat> how did y'all feel about this This. Chase, I think not chase scene, but escape scene. I think that the way Jack was holding his pistol, that's what I said I had said earlier. I think the way that Jack was holding his pistol was more realistic than, you know, doing it uh cowboy style where you got two pistols in each hand and you're like pow, pow. you know, he wasn't doing that. He was holding it more technically accurate. Um when what's your name was behind him, she was kinda meh. But all the rest of the people coming at Jack. You know, I think there was one at one point in time, one dude was holding a shotgun in one hand and a pistol in the other hand and kind of shooting it weird and some other stuff. I don't know. It was fucked up. They're tranced out, bro. They don't have to listen to your fucking realistic gun fucking laws. They're trancing. (laughs) But unfortunately, RJ just cannot control it like Jack can. Technically, she's had more of it inside of her than Jack has. Um, So (laughs) she asked uh, Jack to kill her and Jack does. And with that, we have the movie's best character ever coming back. Shark, baby. Shark is back to do absolutely fucking nothing. He shoots Godzilla. one person and then turns off. Do, 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 yeah, he do, turns do, do. off. Yeah. He shoots one person and then turns the fuck off, and that's it. For a character that was put in the movie to help the... Because they... Uh, Alex, what did you say? They thought... Uh, yeah, the director thought Tim... Because Tim Thomerson got pretty beat up from doing Transfers 1 and 2. He was like he had to like lay up in bed for a couple weeks after because it was you know. No, yeah, this movie's only a year after the second one. Yeah, so it, the the wounds were fresh and all that. So he felt he was like, ooh, okay. Well, he might not be able to uh, deliver. So I'm gonna have another character kind of be his side piece uh, here and there. And then he created Shark. Which was supposed to like boost whatever uh, Thomerson couldn't fulfill, which I got nothing out of that. I don't think I don't hate Shark, but clearly, like when the when this becomes a direct to video type thing, he he kind of makes that happen. He jumped the shark, uh, no pun intended. Yeah, <laughs> he, he, <laughs> he literally just shows up. And kills Ryan in a very lackluster death. Because Ryan's supposed to be this big fucking badass. Just ripped his fucking brother's throat out. And Shark just kind of shows up uh, and, breaks his and neck. shoots him. Or yeah, breaks his neck. And then five seconds later shoots one other person. And then that's it. That's all fucking Shark does. Well, I guess that was kind of big to save him from the guy who just killed his brother. I, I, that's something. I'm just saying that like... 
the, the the look of shark. I mean, we should definitely get into this. Like this whole shark guy, and what we just saw these first two movies. And I'm not saying this is a bad movie. It's really not. It's fine. It's it's obviously a step down. It's obviously everything we all said it was. You know, it's a different level of cheese that maybe isn't as digestible as the first two. And he is a prime reason for this. Uh, I think it's more than that, but I think the decision to add him to the script... Means that we're not taking this seriously. Yes. Right. So, there you go. Uh, I don't know how I feel about Shark. He's not, like, a hateable character. He's not insanely likable. I don't know. He's cool, but that's about it. Uh, I I mean, they enter the last room. Janna shows up and just dies really quickly by getting stabbed. Well, so I don't know what's up with the Transfers trilogy and just having everyone be taken out so easily. Right. Because it, the worst... Fu- okay, someone explained to me how they thought that they should end this movie with Daddy finally getting... Daddy Mutta getting control over Jack and then this guy who was trained who saw field action shoots Jack but fucking hits him in the arm... And then that causes Jack to break the trance and then just shoot two bullets in him and kill him in days fucking one. Who wrote that? Just remember Rambo. This ain't fucking Rambo. Not one person was wearing a bandana. Don't matter. It's the same kind of bullshit. Everybody else can't shoot worth a fuck. But um, the, uh, the hero can. He can hit his mark every time. Yeah, I just really was just like, what the fuck? And then Shark wakes back up. Yeah, after the fact. Yeah, it it was anticlimactic, the whole mutter, mutter kill. Daddy mutter? Call him Daddy mutter. No, that's just, I find that disrespectful. <laughs> um, so Jack goes back up to the line to find out that he is going to be made a peacekeeping emissary, emissary through time and space. Yeah, great. Uh, and that's, that's the end of the fucking movie. Um... It's okay. I think the first one's the best. Second one, uh, not as good, but still really good and really entertaining. Still very personal. Uh, And to me, that's what this third one lost. It did not feel personal. I think when you take Lena out of it, Hmm. it loses that human connection that Jack has. But let's be thankful she was in it at all. Yes, we did get a good ending to her. I am glad they did not just use some throwaway line. Oh, yeah, we broke up six years ago or something like that. Yeah, th- this had a real layer. In, like, th- this movie's kind of, like, uh, melancholy, I guess you could say, because McNulty's dead. Lena and Jack have nothing at this point. The only thread you saw was in the beginning when she was willing to have dinner again. Then you got this whole scene where she's moved on. There isn't much sympathy shown for, like, <clears throat> when he says, yeah, for you it was 13 years, for me it was more like 13 minutes, or whatever he says. She should have walked up to him and just, like, held his face. But, like, wow, I'm so sorry. I I totally know what you're saying because, you know, we've been through all this. And, like, I can't believe it. I'm sorry, dude. Like, you know, like I said, I, I woke up a year later and you weren't around. And I just kind of, like, said, well, what am I going to do? Just die or whatever? Just do nothing? So, like, there, there's so much depth to that that he was shifted into the future. And then when he says... You do realize I could have myself sent back to 91 and none of this would have happened, right? And she yeah. actually made the choice to say you wouldn't do that, would you? So she is actually now actually choosing this world as opposed to her dying relationship with Jack. Yeah, 100%. And, and like uh, Tim Thomerson did state in an interview that they, they were trying to make this movie a little bit darker. And I do think it really – the only darkness in the movie is the breakup with Lena because hmm. uh, they wanted to make it darker and violent. And I do think they made it more violent, but unfortunately I think the, because we got actual like not top notch cheese, but like a little bit of that cringy cheese in this movie yeah. with the action sequences and all that, it really hurts the Lena part. Cause the Lena part in this movie is so good. It really is amazing. Um, but unfortunately, it's it's you know it's the same kind of situation we had in the previous movie with the love triangle and how deep it is. You have something very deep in here too, where we could sit here and wax philosophical about you know what you would do in anyone's position for Lena and Jack, you know. But doggy style. 
Uh huh. But not only does Lena make her decision, Jack made his decision too to to be a uh, transfer hunter first and go back to 2005 instead of going back to 91. He made his decision. She made her decision. Right. And that's very important. It's just unfortunate that the rest of the movie is kind of a schlocky, uh, a cheap VHS action movie. Like this is. Yeah, this we is got a, a little bit of craft in this one. Yeah, this is 100% the definition of of a straight to VHS rental special. Does Transfers One and Two make this easier to swallow and easier to love and embrace? Yes, 100%. Uh, and in fact, I even was I was doing research. I actually read that people that there are there is a group of people who like this movie more than the second one, mm. which I don't understand. No. Uh, unless they just really like action movies. They're like, oh yeah, more action, more gunshots. Fuck yeah. Rapey KKK guy. No, the layers in part two, you can't compare this to that. Yeah, so this is a series that gets worse as it goes on, but it starts off in such a high point that, according to Alex, it doesn't really go down until four, because three is still decent. Um, It makes me want for a better script. Well, I gotta say, four wasn't atrocious. It was, if you're already into Jack Death, 4 isn't insanely horrible. It's almost just a little lesser than this, but then 5 is where you go, ooh, okay. That's bad. 4 is just a tad less than this. I might watch 4 just for the fuck of it. Yeah, I'm debating one. Here's the problem. Four and five are like part one and two of something. Oh, so we gotta watch four, five, and six. No, no, no. Just four and five are a two parter. Okay. Yeah. So uh, it's up to you. I mean, listen, <laughs> you're gonna be tempted to watch part five, I'm sure, because I just went right into it, of course. Well, Trancers, okay, so Trancers two and Trancers three are both rated. A 5.5 on INDB. Uh, the first movie's rated 6.1. Trancers 4 is only a 5.1, but Trancers 5 is a 4.9. Surprisingly enough, in Trancers 6, ooh, 4.4. The highest rated in the series is Trancers City of Lost Angels at a 7.1, which was the short. Wow. That's interesting. Um, I don't even know what to say about that. Oh, uh, so how do you guys feel about... um? them taking the score and dropping it into this movie. Now, listen, part one score, epic, fucking perfect for that movie. Part two, I'm happy to hear it in that movie. Didn't really distract me. It was the right, it was the, it's transfers. Part three, gotta say that although I really enjoy this movie, I've watched this movie about eight times. I'm fine. I'll watch it again. I'll watch it the rest of my life, I'm sure. I've really nothing against it. I'm happy to watch the trilogy. But I got to say when when the scores, when the cues dropped here, it sort of stood out instead of marrying what's on screen. Honestly, in this one I really didn't pay it any mind, to be perfectly honest with you. I, it was just there. I did, I didn't focus on it Right. Because, it's your first viewing, right, of course. But on top of that, it was so much of the same. Mm-hmm. And so I'm just like, whatever. You know what I mean? I mean, there really wasn't nothing to me that set it apart. Well, it technically isn't a part. What I'm saying is, I don't think it fits this movie the same way it fits the other two. The way this movie looked was completely different than the other one. So the, the other two still had that more grainy feel. This one didn't have that grainy feel. This one had that more of, even though it didn't take place in space, it still had the... Uh, it still had the the feel of being in outer space, if that makes sense. No, I get it. like a Jason X movie sort of. Yeah, kind of. Like you know, it it, it kind of had that feel to it, where you where you're you know because in the in the in the in the you know the the strip club hive, the when you're in there, it had the small corridors, you know, things like that, where you look like you're moving around in a damn uh, a space station. And that that's kind of what that's kind of the feel that I got out of this movie. And, and and even when you're not in the in the in the strip hive, you know you got other places that it it still all felt like that kind of movie. 
And so that look of it, you know, I really didn't, again, I really didn't pay attention to the score at all to see if it kind of changed with the feel or whatever to see if it did or did not fit. And, and that's the reason why I'm saying, I think to me in this one, the score was insignificant. Hmm. I I never notice scores in movie. I'm I'm the worst at it. Unless it's extremely bad, I never notice it. Yeah, you might as well not even. You might as well not. Jerry didn't pay attention. Well, I thought Jay was the guy who didn't notice him. He doesn't uh, notice either. But uh, hey, guys, breaking news: uh, Larry Cohen died. Yeah. I'm sorry. I suck. Who's he? Uh, he did. Uh, it's alive. Q. Uh, he returned to Salem slots. Um, oh, wow. Uh, the Stuff would be probably his biggest movie that you know. I fucking love The Stuff. Yeah, the, he, so, like, he, God told me to and shit. It fucking, yeah, apparently he, he just, he's he's dead. He wrote way more than he directed, but still. This, you, you do realize, no pun intended with a Jack Death thing, but this is the year of the death. Like, do you realize how many people have died that we give a shit about? Well, yeah, they're all getting old. That's the thing. And I think this is going to continue. Like, we were spared. You know, people complained about that one year. I think it was like 15 or whatever. That there were too many, like, Prince and all these other guys or whatever it was. Like, there was a bunch of deaths. But this year, it's already like 15 people that we even know. And about five we care about. See, the thing about it is, is I, I, I've been thinking about that kind of thing as we're watching our celebrity, um, uh, I, I guess the artist that we look at pass on. And the unfortunate thing about it is, is that we're not, a lot of times you don't take into consideration yourself along the line as it is. You know, when we were kids, all of us, when we were kids, we are looking at these things and we start paying attention to the artists themselves and not just paying attention to their products. And when you start paying attention to them, you're just like, oh my God, you know, and you never really think about the fact that there is a, a limited amount of time when you're a kid. And then when you start getting older and you start watching these people that have had such a big influence in your life start disappearing because of but you know death and things like that that really starts to give you a a perspective on you know the uh, almost how minuscule you are in the in, in the grand scheme of things because not only do you start seeing and paying more attention to the fact of your idols passing on and whatnot but, but it starts happening in your in your direct family and so you know, it, it, it's it's kind of weird how that sort of thing kind of kind of falls in to where you start beginning to contemplate the 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 I guess the brief scope of yourself and also other people that you're you're influenced by in your life. It's fucking it, it's insane when you really start taking the time to to think about it because you're just going to and and it's just going to like you said Alex it's just going to keep happening because that's just the natural order of thing and we're just going to keep watching Oh it's going to be insane like I already thought people have said to me like they're <clears throat> coming to me now because you know there have been a few deaths I really care about so I'm going to say like you realize like Stallone Schwarzenegger um Al Bundy you know all these people are like 70 dude and you do realize this is going to be a fucking avalanche for the next 10 years of your life, right? And Alice Cooper, you know, like all these people that I really care about. Tim Thomerson. Eventually, Keith Richards is going to die. I don't know about that one. <laughs> I mean, eventually it will happen. He may be like 100. I mean, not in our lifetime. I think it'll happen in our lifetime. But, I mean, you know, but that's just the thing about it. I mean, it's just like, you know, when we were kids, all these people, you know, I started looking at the fact of how, how old some of these people are when they were filming some of the some of our favorite movies. You know what I'm saying? I mean, goddamn, you know, you look at Stallone when he was fucking doing the Rambo movies, and, and, and damn, you know, he's in his 30s, almost his 40s. Fucking goddamn uh, uh, Harrison Ford when he was doing Indiana Jones was already in his 40s. Right. So he's going to be in that, you know, it's going to, dude, it's going to be an avalanche. I'm telling you, the next 10 years, we're going to be talking about this every, like, three months. 
Yeah, but the thing about it is, is also you got to look at the the level of influence that these people have in pop culture. I mean, nobody. I mean, I'm sure that people that were that were from our previous generation look at you know uh, saw people like uh, Fred Astaire and play and people like that who started dropping off. Uh, and, and are like, man, I can't believe he went. I can't believe he went. Like, you know. And uh, but the thing about it is, is in our generation of people from, you know, the entertainment things that we watch from the '70s, '80s, and the '90s, and and the new millennium, there is so much greater of an amount of media that's out there. Right. So we have more access to them. Exactly. So so like you know when you've got fucking ten or fifteen celebrities to us that die within a few months you know it's it, it it has more of an impact on us because we have got such a big range of things and we can recognize you know these 10 or 15 people that have died in such a in such a short amount of time because it's like we know them all versus the generation before us that doesn't know as many as we do i mean hell i mean you just look like right now i'm looking up at my blu-ray collection there's almost 400 fucking blu-rays right above my head mm-hmm and God knows how many fucking people are in all these, are involved in them, you know? And and something clicked with us with a lot of them. Like, look at Luke Perry. He's 52 years old. So now you're saying that a guy at 52 is just as vulnerable as a person in their 70s? Dude, we are fucked. Yeah, my, hell, my dad died at 53, man. My dad was 53 years old when he died. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's like, okay, well, at this current moment in time, I'm going to be 36 this year. So, you know, that's less than, you know, the age of 53, the year that my dad, the the age that my dad died, 52, the age that Luke Perry died, is less than 20 years away from me. I'm 13 years away. Exactly. I can get a blood clot or a fucking stroke, whatever, you know, like. Like I said, I mean, like I said earlier, it just, it really brings into perspective you know the the I guess the the brief span that you have in the history of this planet. It's fucking crazy. Yeah, even without looking at like celebrities, uh, like Kenneth personally had uh, over the past year had three people he know die mm-hmm. personally, and then uh, one almost dies. So it, it like. It seems like when death comes, it, it creeps out of nowhere as soon as you're happy and just punches you in the stomach and reminds you that he's always just around the corner. Yep. Tiffany's grandmother died in January, and my uncle died the same day as Luke Perry. And uh, I guess it was uh, May, uh, March 4th. So, yeah, I don't know, it's hitting me personally and... Yeah, it's uh, like I said, man. It's crazy, you know. Like Jerry was saying last year, my buddy Tommy killed himself. My buddy Alan died in a motorcycle accident, and then my buddy Joe killed himself, and then Jerry almost killed himself. Yeah, in the same year. Crazy. Yeah, you know, as many times as I thought about suicide, I eventually said, you know what, fuck it, I'm gonna die anyway. <laughs> it ain't like it matters anyway. I'll be gone in a, you know, one day. It it all goes by so quick anyway. What's the point of rushing it? Let's just see what happens until that day. I, I had a different viewpoint on 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 suicide until it you, everything everything always looks different from the outside, and then when you have you get a very very different perspective on it when you have people that are close to you do it. You know, like uh, Tommy had his own reasons that involved a woman. Joe had his own reasons that also involved a woman, but on a much deeper scale. And then obviously Alan, you know, died in a motorcycle accident. There wasn't shit you can do about that. But when it comes to suicide, you know, and then, and then Jerry's perspective there where his was based on, you know, uh, biological things, a disease, you know, so it's just like, goddamn, you know what I mean? So it's like I have a completely different outlook on people that commit suicide because there are so many various reasons that somebody would want to. And even though I still stand on the main reason why I have never even attempted is because my biggest fear is you don't know what's after. Mm. And so it's just like, okay, well, what if all the fucking goddamn stupid Christians have it right? And you goddamn kill yourself. Yeah, then and I'm you fucking, fucked. Yeah, then you're fucked, you know? Or what if one of my biggest fears is what if there's nothing? What if you die and there's nothing? Well, that's that's what I really believe it is. 
I mean, it's weird because all these weird coincidences and stuff. Like, I have a zillion reasons to believe that this is all meant to be and stuff. And there's there are some bizarre things that you couldn't even imagine happen on the same day. Um, and it has to mean something. It means that this is all... Like, for example, the old theory is, you know, you walk on a beach and you see a watch. You know, one of those old watches that you used to see with the guys with the chains on them. It was just the round thing. A pocket watch. Yeah. You see him sitting on the beach. So you look at it and you say, well, there must have been a watchmaker who made this, right? So you look at us and you're saying, well, what are you saying? Like, nobody made us. We're just... Well, my problem with that is that is an ever going argument because they go well someone had to make us okay well then who created god who created the thing that created god who created the thing that created the thing that created god and it just it just it's an ongoing like like if you're interested in some stuff like that listen to sam harris dude oh my god that guy will blow your fucking mind with he's an he's an atheist and he will blow your fucking mind with shit like that but I mean, but going back to it, I mean that's that's my biggest fear is that 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 is one hundred percent true. That 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 damn everything that has happened to us and the and the reason why we are the reigning species of intelligence on this planet supposedly is that damn it's all about chance. It's all coincidence, and that we're, that we're nothing but animals with a higher intelligence than the other animals on this planet, and that when we die, there's nothing else. That our consciousness does not continue on. It doesn't go down the line. No, nope, yeah, intelligent nothing. design happens to just be coincidence. Yeah, everything, everything that everything that we have learned and so on and so forth is for is it's just for our own amusement for the time span that we're on this planet and for nothing else. And you the, can spend the that evolution entire time of the watching trancers. Yeah, and I mean, yeah. so, and listen, when Jack Death singes a trancer, do you think that he really goes to heaven? Yes. Do transfers go to heaven? And what is it? So a transfer is a regular person, and then all of a sudden... They're druggies. Oh my god, though. All all the transfer movies are just anti-drug movies. <laughs> well, Think so about it. A- even even ha- being an alcoholic, it's all anti-drug abuse shit. Hey, watch it. Well, that's the same thing that I thought about when I was when I was watching these. <laughs> is the same thing that happens to Phil, and it's like, okay, well, what happens to these other people? I mean, Jack Death doesn't even think about the fact that he's just fucking murdering all these people that can't do anything about the fact that they're in it in the first one. Oh wait, how about right? Like, listen, what I was gonna say about Jack Death murdering these people? Does that mean because they said they killed a million transfers in Part Three? Now. Does that mean that everybody's just normal and then this happens? Can they go back to normal or are they just a transfer for life after that? In moment? the third one, it's a choice, remember? Oh, oh, yeah, right, right. Okay, but what about part one when that Santa Claus guy turned into one? See, I I, I don't think it's – you can really talk about part one and the transfer choice because they don't explain it well enough. You have to get to part two where they explain it well enough to where it, it – it, because in part two, when he uh, pulls up to Green World and uh, he shoots the fucking cops and takes Alice, right? That's what I was gonna say. He That's doesn't okay. know that those are uh, that those are transfers, and we don't know that they're transfers because we don't see them do the whole red line evaporate thing. And when that girl shoots the cop, we don't see that lady evaporate either. Correct. Well, in that one, they go, "Oh, well, she was a CIA agent under." Um, yeah, she had nail polish on and jewelry. Yeah. Yeah. So she was just a bad guy. But the point is, is that, yeah, I, I agree with you. It's like, okay, well, after he stops taking over their bodies in the first one, after Whistler stops taking over their bodies, can they go back? Or are they stuck as a transfer? Right. And how come just because Whistler takes over them psychologically, why would they evaporate? Yeah, that's another thing. I mean, so there are definitely some unexplained things in this series. I want to talk to uh, Charles Band. Send him an email. He might be one of the people that actually emails you back. Yeah. Hell, I, I want more explanation. I'm so into this that I want to understand. I mean, you've had you've had fucking luck with just emailing people. I mean, shit. Oh, yeah, 30 interviews. Yeah, I was going to say, look at the folks that have been on the skeleton crew. Absolutely. We'll do it again. I'll get this guy. I want to know what the fuck a transfer is once and for all. We need yeah. explanations. Yeah, and then we can have him on when we do the Doll Man series. <laughs> yeah. Oh God. We, hey man, Doll Man was actually pretty good. The first one was really good. If Jerry does know, uh, Jack Death is uh, Doll Man. Yeah. 
Oh, so it's not one of the killer doll movies? No, 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 no. Oh, doll? shit, then I'd watch it. No, that's demonic toys. Yeah, Doll Man is like uh, if a fucking, you know, one of our normal size action figures came to life. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's pretty good. He's not Doll Man. He's Action Figure Man. Thank yeah. you very much. But, what? yeah, that one's nope. pretty good. Me and Dad actually watched that on a whim one time, and we was like, oh, surprisingly, this was actually not bad. Yeah, I watched it with Daddy Mudder. Daddy Mata. <laughs> Hello, Fada. <laughs> Here I am at Camp Granada. Yeah. Thank you for listening to our Trancers <laughs> Trilogy special. We had a blast. Thank you to Alex for not only coming on, making us watch these movies, but also <laughs> producing the show. What a champ. Everyone give him a round of applause that he cannot hear because this is a podcast. Thank you for listening. We had a good time. Go send yourself a trancer, baby, because that's what life is all about.